Okay, this is lecture number 10, part two. And this discussion is going to take place between 1960 and 1969. I want to cover the presidencies of John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson in this lecture. And I decided to take it out of the first one because it's getting too long. And this lecture should be right at two hours and not be a three hour lecture like the other ones have been. But this is going to be an interesting lecture for you guys to consider. This lecture is going to start off with Mr. Richard Nixon believing that he is going to become the next president of the United States. He is totally convinced the American people will keep on the traditions of Eisenhower as him being vice president would get the presidency. You know, it's very few times that a vice president, president actually enters the presidency. Uh, most times they do not make it. There's only been a handful of vice presidents, mostly through the death of a president that becomes a president. So a vice president usually does not get the office of president. Well, Richard Nixon is totally convinced that with his fighting against communism, his stance toward, toward the Cold War, his stance toward civil rights <clears throat> would make him an easy candidate for the presidency here in 1960. He runs the Republican for the presidency. Running as a Democrat for the presidency is going to be a hero from World War II. He fought out in the Pacific on a PT boat called PT-109. He wrote a book in 1955 about his service in the military. And of course, it's a bestseller. It turns out that John F. Kennedy did not write that book. as written by a ghostwriter. He told the tale, but he did not actually write the book. But John Kennedy is a senator from Massachusetts. Uh, he's from the, one of the wealthiest families in America. Joseph Kennedy had made his money in bootlegging during the 1920s. Joseph Kennedy became a big friend, a big pile of Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, and Roosevelt made him minister to England in the late 1930s. And when World War II broke out, the Kennedy children with their mama Rose came home to America to avoid being part of this war. Joseph Kennedy stayed on for a few for a few more uh, for a few more months, but the, but the Kennedy family came home during the blitz that took place over London in the early 1940s. So the Kennedy family is pretty well known. They're one of the America's royal couples, if you want to call them that, are royal families, if you want to call them that at this time period. But John Kennedy has a hang-up about being on television. CBS, NBC, and ABC News have asked these two gentlemen to give the American people a debate in October of 1960 to let the American people see the two candidates on television and let them debate the issues that, they're, that they are trying to solve. Well, John Kennedy doesn't, doesn't want to do it. It's going to take several visits from these network heads, particularly Walter Cronkite of CBS News, to finally convince Ken Kennedy to debate Nixon on television. And they chose the first week of October of 1960 for the first of the three debates. Now here's what's interesting about this first debate. And this is what really set the president for this election of 1960. John Kennedy and his wife, Jacqueline, are going to go to California the Friday before the debate on Monday night. And on this Friday, they're going to go to Rayo D to, to Radio Drive, and they're going to buy clothes. They buy designer clothes. They don't buy from Kmart. They don't buy from, from, the, from the little shops here of this time period. They buy designer clothes. They don't buy the cheap stuff. So they go to Radio Drive in Beverly Hills, and they buy their outfits for this debate. John Kennedy buys a brand-new suit. It is fitted. He buys a new shirt, new tie, scarf, or, or I should say handkerchief for his, for, his, for his coat pocket. He's going to look good here for this debate. Jacqueline, of course, bought her Pierre Baldwin dresses. She loved the Paris designers. She loved Chanel and all these guys. And her favorite designer was Pierre Balmain. He's also designed a lot, a lot of airline uniforms during this time period. So a lot of these flight attendants of the 1960s are going to resemble Jackie Kennedy in her dress and the way she dresses, her fashion sense. Okay, Saturday, they spent most of the day on the beach. They went out and played, had a picnic, and had a good time. And on Sunday, they are going to fly to Chicago where the debate takes place. And Sunday afternoon, John Kennedy is going to 
practice his or memorize his notes, practice his debating skills. That even they go out for dinner. Uh, Monday morning they get up early. He starts doing more study and more prep work. At five o'clock in the afternoon, they head for the studio. They're early, and he gets himself all dressed up. She's all dolled up, and they look like a Hollywood couple. All right. Richard Nixon, his wife, Patty, flown to California on that Friday before the debate, but he's been all weekend politicking. He went to various, various um, areas to give political speeches across California, and he didn't leave California till like one o'clock in the afternoon, which is two o'clock, which is which is twelve o'clock in Chicago. His plane was delayed, and they arrived about thirty minutes before the debate started. Richard Nixon has a heavy beard and they want him to shave so he'll look more, he won't look like a bum on television. His, his dark shadowed face would make him look like he was uncapped. But he decided he had enough time to shave so they put this waxy material, this lotion material on his face to cover up his beard. Well, during the debate under those hot lights, that stuff started running. And he got his handkerchief, and he started rubbing his face. The more he rubbed, the more nappy his face looked. He looked bad. He did not look so hot in this debate. Richard Nixon also had knee surgery back in the, back in the early or the late spring. He had not fully recovered from his surgery, and he had lost about 35 or 40 pounds from this surgery. The suit he brought with him to wear, which he did not try on previously, he brought the suit with him, and the suit was way too big. He bought the suit for Easter. He had lost so much weight that the suit coat looked like his daddy's coat as on a little kid. So Richard Nixon did not have the presidential appearance that John Kennedy had. And during the, during the debate, they're both asked the same questions here for them to respond to. And then they would go through and respond to each other's answers to these various questions here in this debate. Okay? Well, guys. In this debate, John Kennedy made very good points. He made very good observations, and he seemed to have a plan for the presidency. Richard Nixon, however, most times agreed with John Kennedy and didn't have much more to add to the discussion. <clears throat> the people who watched the debate on television said that, that John Kennedy was definitely the winner of the debate. The people who, who listened on the radio believe that Mr. Nixon had done better with the debate. Okay? Well, guys, the first debate always sets off the presidential election. Y'all remember the debate between Joe Biden and President Trump and how Trump tried to domineer and, over, and overrun Biden all in debates, and he came up being the loser of debates because he was so ill-mannered, according to the American people. He butted in. He shouted. He had some issues here that the American people did not appreciate. And it's going to be a major factor in the election of 2020 <clears throat> when he does not win for re-election here by the popular vote or through the Electoral College. Okay, in this election, Mr. Kennedy won the election by 100,000 votes. A lot of folks said that he had cheated. Sound familiar? That he had counted in his ballots dead people who lived in Chicago. They said the Chicago Mafia got involved, and they went through and added votes to the election for John Kennedy by registering and voting for dead folks. So you had a big debate here, guys, of who actually won the election. And the Electoral College, they decided that John Kennedy had won the election. Mr. Nixon was not a happy camper about this. And Mr. Nixon goes back to California pretty upset. In 1962, Mr. Nixon runs for the governor of California, and he loses. And mad over his defeat in California, his home state, Richard Nixon tells the American people, you will never have Dick Nixon to kick around anymore. I am never again going to run for a public office but I am tired of being abused and, and being mistreated in the electorate. I am being cheated and I will not run again. So Mr. Nixon had a very, very interesting 
stance toward these two elections here in the early 1960s. Richard Nixon always felt that he could never secede. He was Quaker by faith. His mother <clears throat> had raised him as a mommy's boy pretty much. And he always had an inferiority complex that he was not good enough. He played sports, he was not good enough. Uh, he's running for political office, he proves not to be good enough. And it, and it really, really affects the mindset of Richard Nixon, okay? Remember also that Richard Nixon had been part of the McCarthy hearings in which he had gotten advice from Roy Kahn, that, general, that, that attorney general out of New York State, who told him to learn how to develop an, alt an alternative reality. Find a way to take a subject matter that is pretty much true and try to twist it. Try to twist facts into your own opinion, into your own persona, and then say it enough times that people will believe that it is true. So Roy Kahn played a major role here, guys, in both the presidencies of Richard Nixon and the presidency of Donald Trump. And I want you guys to remember this man. I think that if you go through and look at villains in American history, Roy Kahn is going to be one of them. J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI, is going to be one of them. Uh, Joseph McCarthy and his witch and his trials are going to be part of it. These all these guys are going to become major obst obstacles here to the American people when it comes to facts and elections and all this kind of stuff. Okay, how you see America. All right, you know, we always believe that presidents never lied. We always believe that presidents were above, above uh, the morals of most people, that they, where they were held a, a, a more moral stance in their personal lives. And over the last 40 years of the presidencies, we realize they'll do anything to get elected. They'll say anything, they'll do anything. It's an interesting situation when it comes to politics. George Washington warned us of this. In 1796, he said, you will have unscrupulous people who will run for the presidency and get elected, and they will harm democracy. They could harm your freedoms if they are elected. Be careful about who you vote for. And he told us, don't have political parties. That political parties will turn into religions. Well, guess what? In the 1960s, the two political parties start heading toward a religious stance. If you're not Republican, you're not saved. If you're not Republican, you can't be a Christian. If, you're, if, if you are a Democrat, you can't be a Christian and all this kind of stuff. So it really is an interesting uh, situation here when it starts with the election of 1960 and Richard Nixon and what he tries to do here in this time period, and then tells the American people, I will not be back. I will not be back. You cannot count on Richard Nixon anymore. I don't care what happens to you as a person, okay? In this election of 1960, we find the power of the television. We realize the television is gonna be a major, major instrument in the future, that we will decide presidencies by the television. You know, I always said that eventually the presidential elections will turn into the American Idol. You'll have 20 people who will run for the presidency, and each week somebody gets voted, voted off. And you're seeing that nowadays, that you'll see a person run for the president, they look pretty good, it's after the first debate, all of a sudden three of the people drop out. And then all of a sudden, by the fifth week of the, of the election of the primary cycle, you're down to like five people. They've been voted off. They, they cannot make it and they realize they can't make it. And then the last ones are dependent upon the debates that take place toward the end of the primaries. And of course, the winner of the primaries is the one who runs for the presidency. And then he's trying to fight, or she's trying to fight, the opposite side. So it's interesting how all of this is looking like a television show. And a lot of people do see it as being a television show. You do have media-made presidents. They're made by the media. The media is the one who's going to fo focus their decisions, their administration, by what makes the news. What is the most popular way to make the news? And that's going to be a major, major part, starting mainly in 2000, with the political atmosphere here in America. Okay? 
people saw John and Jacqueline Kennedy as being our royal couple. They looked like movie stars. They were well-dressed. They were well-mannered. They had straightened teeth. Their teeth was white. Y'all look at Eleanor Roosevelt's mouth. Or look at Franklin Roosevelt's mouth and how twisted their teeth are. And, and other people who had been the president. And here these people have perfectly white teeth. They're straight. And they look good. I mean, Jacqueline, she has her hair done professionally. She goes out to California. If she brings in hairdressers to the White House, you know, the president has his own barber. And they all always look immaculate here in this time period. You know, guys, in 1961, a new Broadway show came out. It starred Rex Harrison, and it starred Catherine Hepburn, and it's called Camelot. And Camelot becomes a major movie in 1961. It, in, it involves one of the kings of England back in the high Middle Ages. All right? Well, this play, Camelot, become a major production on Broadway. People love the movie, the, 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 uh, the actual uh, play on Broadway. It was turned into a movie. People, it's one of the best-selling movies of 1961, the same year that Kill a Mockingbird came out, and they competed for the Oscars here in this time period. Um, Camelot invo involved British royalty. And so we decided to call the thousand days of John Kennedy Camelot. It's a period that is known as Camelot, the thousand days of John Kennedy. John Kennedy comes to the American people on the inaugural platform on the 20th day of January, 1961, and he tells the American people, I am of your generation. I am the first American president who was born in the 20th century. He was. Eisenhower was born in the late, in the late 1890s, or in the 1890s, and John Kennedy was born in 1917. So he is a first generation president here of the 20th century. He's also the second youngest man to take the oath of office. The youngest man was Theodore Roosevelt, but he was not elected. He got there by assassination. John Kennedy is the youngest elected president to the presidency. And then of course you have Mr. Bill Clinton and you have Mr. Barack Obama. And those have been your youngest presidents. And me personally, I like those 40 year old presidents. They have a learning curve. And you want a president who has a learning curve that learns how to take care of the American people. They don't take care of themselves or their friends. They take care of the American people. And these 40-year-olds become president. They'll live to be 80, 90 years old. They'll live 20 or 30 years past their presidency, and they can see what kind of mistakes they made, how they affected the American public. I don't like these 70 year old presidents. They won't live long enough to make a difference and they will never care about what the future holds. You know, these younger ones do because they're the ones with younger kids. They're the ones who have, have teenagers and so forth. And they're looking out not only for the present generation, but for the next two generations, their children and their grandchildren. Okay. So John Kennedy is a perfect age for the presidency. Okay, he tells the American people that I'm going to build a new frontier. Instead of a new deal or a new plan, he's going to have a new frontier. And the new frontier is going to be space. He tells the American people that I'm going to put more money into the space program. And therefore, he expands NASA. And with NASA, you're going to have various programs that John Kennedy says will get us to the moon by the end of the decade. Okay. You'll soon, see, you'll soon see Mr. Carpenter go around the earth. You'll see John Glenn go around the earth three times, come home, and within a couple of months, falls in the bathtub and hurts himself. Funny, he circled the earth three times, goes home and falls in the bathtub. All right. Then you're going to have the Gemini programs. The Gemini programs are going to start testing to see how proven our, our ships are, our, our missiles are going into space. And then from there, you have the Apollo program that's going to start heading toward the moon. We'll go one third of the way. We'll go, we'll go one half the way. We'll go, one, we'll go almost to the moon. We'll go and circle the moon. And then, in, and then in the summer of 1969, we're going to land on the moon. 
You know, it's really interesting about these moon landings. A lot of people believed it was all fake news. They thought that, that Hollywood had gotten in with NASA and they went out into the painted deserts of, of Arizona and they got out there and created what looked like a moonscape. And they went through and designed exactly what, 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 what the uh, NASA had shot off on the rocket. And they built the same kind of spaceship sitting out there in, uh, in Arizona. You remember, guys, we didn't have a good video during this time period. And so when the astronauts left the Apollo capsule to get into the landing craft, the Eagle, we didn't see all this. We didn't see the Eagle come off of the spaceship and land next to the missile. It was done in stop motion sort of a way. And so you didn't see the full picture. So a lot of people don't believe that we actually landed on the moon. They want more proof of it. So I think it's kind of interesting that they, they would, think, would think that in this time period. But here you start seeing people question the news and what's being, what's being sold to the American people here. Okay, John Kennedy also is going to help the American poor. He's the first president who really looks at poverty in America. Of the American people of this time period, 20% of the people went hungry at night. Little kids could not afford their 35 cent lunches at school. And John Kennedy tries to find ways to influence are to try to solve the problems of poverty in America. I want to tell you guys something. We are normally about 40% of the people in America are below the property line. This has been the same case as the colonial period. When the economy booms and people get jobs and we have a, we have a pretty good economy going on, unemployment, the poor will go down to about 32% at the most. Okay, so it's a real problem here, guys, dealing with poverty in this time period. And so this president wants to find a way to start feeding the poor folks through federal programs. Okay, now this really starts happening toward the end of Kennedy's life. This is like 1963 time period that you start seeing this. John Kennedy also wants to have African Americans during this time period. Mr. Kennedy does have meetings with Martin Luther King Jr. from time to time. The two men seem to be friends of each other. Mr. King wants to progress civil rights across America extremely quickly. Mr. Kennedy believes America's not ready for it, particularly the American South. And his concern in the election process was trying to keep the American South democratic. They're heading toward the Republican Party. He's trying to find a way to keep it democratic. And he figured if he put a Southerner on the ticket, that the Southern people would vote for him and the Southern legislators would approve of his programs that he wanted to put in place in the early 1960s. So the man he chose as vice president is a gentleman from Texas. This young Senator, this young congressional member, went to Washington, D.C. during the Roosevelt time period and made his way up through the system until he becomes a powerful force in the United States Senate, the United States Congress. His name is Lyndon Johnson. And Lyndon Johnson grew up poor. He knows what it's like not to know where the next meal is going to come from. And he lived in a high country, Texas, agricultural area with lots of cows. And he had a problem finding food as a young boy out here in Johnson City, Texas. This is out here outside of, outside of Wimberley and, and uh, Fredericksburg, and you go up there above San Antonio. This is where he was from up here in the hill country of Texas. If you guys have not been to the hill country of Texas, you need to go. You know how beautiful our beaches are and how blue the water is and how clean it looks? Well, there are rivers in central Texas are covered, are, are actually laid out inside of stone. They have stone banks and stone, and stone, stone uh, surfaces in the bottom of these rivers here. And the, and the water looks like swimming pool water. It's, it's a, kind, of a kind of a real pretty green color out here. 
It's an interesting place to go to. There's all kinds of caves and places to, to, to see. You're not too far from Austin. It's a good place to go to on a vacation. Go to San Antonio to the River Walk where they went through and, and actually cemented up the river. The river runs inside of cement uh, banks. It's really a beautiful place to go to here. Okay, so John, so Mr. Kennedy is going to bring in Johnson to help him get civil rights legislation pushed through Congress because he is a Southerner. Now, why is that important? because the Southern Democrats do not want to do anything that a Yankee president wants done in this time period. And Mr. Kennedy was called a Yankee president down here during his term. He's from, he is from uh, Massachusetts, and the people just don't trust anybody from the North here in the South in this time period. Okay? So he's got to have an ally that the Southerners can look to for help. Okay? To, be, to have their interest at heart, okay? The interesting thing about this is that Lyndon Johnson's gonna fool them. He's gonna fool these Southern Democrats. He's gonna fool these Southern congressional members of how he handles a job. He's gonna be a lot like Andrew Jackson. He's gonna get his way. He has to go through and beat you down and threaten your wife and your children. You're gonna learn to support Lyndon Johnson here in this time period, okay? So Mr. Johnson's in here. He's also very much a part of this war on poverty. And that'll be a major issue for him in his presidency, okay? Mr. Kennedy is going to go through and start what is called the Peace Corps. The Peace Corps is gonna work hand in hand with the United Nation when it comes to human rights. The Peace Corps are gonna send out our, our, our kids between the ages of 18 and 25, when you finish high school and you don't want to go to college, if you want some experience, you join the Peace Corps. If you have finished two years of college and you're not sure what to major in, you join the Peace Corps. When you finish college, you've joined the Peace Corps. And the Peace Corps is going around the world to help people who are struggling in third world society. They're going to look at vaccinations of the children, particularly with smallpox and polio. They're going to bring in health care. A lot of these people become nurses and doctors who work in the Peace Corps. You're going to see all kinds of social workers in the Peace Corps. At the Valparaiso Library, where I am director, I had a history class with the older people. The class started with age 70. And 70-year-olds and 80-year-olds, even 90-year-olds would come to my history class. And one of the ladies in my history class had worked for the Peace Corps. And she, I had her speak one day, it's a, it's a two-hour class, I had her speak about what she did in the Peace Corps. And she worked down in Colombia and Bolivia, down in South America, for the Peace Corps. So you learn things from talking to people about their experiences, about their life experiences and what they have done. And I have been so lucky to meet so many different people who can tell me all these stories that fills out your history class to make you see it in a different perspective. You know, be it good or be it bad, you can understand what's going on here from the stories of these people that have been encountered in my life and talk, and talk with here, okay? So the Peace Corps becomes a major program here. Remember, we're going to have a program on the war on poverty for the poor folks in America. We have the Peace Corps for the world. We're trying to find a new agenda here, guys. And also, by bringing, by bringing medical, food, clothing, all these very housing, all these various elements that people need, you promote democracy. It's another way to have a containment against communism. Okay? So it's really interesting here. I want to tell you, another, guys, another thing you don't realize about this time period. Your churches get heavily involved in missionary work. After World War II, the Southern Baptist Convention, the United Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church, all these groups started sending people around the world as missionaries, and they helped with the poor and with the hungry. They followed the rules of Christ. Take care of your brothers. Take care of those who are needy. And this is a main agenda here of the missionary movement in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. You had a minister who is going to start preaching on television. William Randolph Hearst discovered him on a roadside in Southern California 
preaching out of a tent. William Randolph Hearst going to LA would, would go by this big, huge tent. There'd be cars parked all around, a big sign out front saying the great revival. Do you know Jesus? And one afternoon, he told his chauffeur, pull in there. I want to see what's going on. And here he met a new, a young preacher, fairly good looking preacher. That's what got the women in there. Preachers always try to make themselves look presentable for the women. You get the women in the church, the men are right behind them. You get the women in the church, their children are right behind them. And so Billy Graham looked like a movie star up here preaching, and William Randolph Hearst began to sponsor him because Mr. Graham had a message against communism. He told the American people, if you don't turn back toward the church, Russia is going to take us over, just like Nebuchadnezzar took over Israel because they started worshiping false gods. If you don't be careful, the Russians are going to get us, and they're going to put us into captivity, and we'll have no Christianity until finally a great Moses will arise and deliver us out of communism, deliver us out of this slavery. And Billy Graham became the minister for your presidents. He's a minister who told Mr. Eisenhower, even though he was a believer, that he needed to be baptized. He worked closely with John Kennedy, who was a Catholic. Billy Graham was Baptist. His big buddies of John Kennedy, his big buddies of Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford and big buddies of Jimmy Carter. He had some influences over Ronald Reagan, but Ronald Reagan found his old minister, the head of the moral majority, whose name was Jerry Falwell. So the Grahams play a major role here, guys. Even Franklin's out there trying to raise money to help third world countries and all this kind of stuff. So it's part of it here in this time period, okay? So Lyndon Johnson was brought in to make sure Southern Democrats would be on board with Kennedy's agenda, okay? Then here's another issue. Uh, John Kennedy decided to bring his little brother in to be attorney general. His little brother's name was Robert, Robert Kennedy. They, they called him Bobby. They had three boys who had survived after World War I, after World War II. The oldest son had died in World War II. John Kennedy was the second son. Then you had Rob, then you had Bobby, and then you had, um, um, Oh, goodness, what's his first name? My mind doesn't slip me here. I see his picture. I can see his face. It'll come to me. I'll tell you who it is in a little bit. But there's a third brother who's also in, this, it's also in the Congress during this time period. Okay? Well, guys, John Kennedy put his brother Bobby into the attorney general's position. A major problem in the 1960s was the mob and mob influences. They were in charge of the Timster unions. They were in charge of a lot of your stores. They were trying to get involved in the airline business, trying to get labor uh, involved in their mob operations. It's a big problem here with the mob in this time period. Well, guys, it turns out that a lot of people realize in Chicago, the mob kind of controlled the election in Chicago. They put John Kennedy into the presidency mainly because his father, Joseph Kennedy, was part of the mob. And Bobby Kennedy goes after the mob. A lot of folks believe the mob was behind the assassination of John Kennedy because they turned on him. Because they turned on him. Bobby Kennedy is also a major force in the civil rights movement. When James Meredith decides to attend the University of Mississippi at Oxford, Ole Miss, Bobby Kennedy sent in the marshals. He, he threatened to bring in the 101st Airborne Division. Bobby Kennedy worked closely with Dr. King's agenda. When they had the, when they had the, uh, the, uh, the bus, uh, the bus situation here in the time period, the, the trailways, the Greyhound bus situation here, uh, this was, uh, was called the Freedom Rides of 1961. And these Freedom Rides of 1961, Bobby Kennedy had the marshals waiting in Montgomery, Atlanta, Birmingham, and Jackson, Mississippi when they arrived here in this time period. He's trying to keep the violence down as people test their freedom. 
okay? What it boils down to, guys, in the Freedom Rides, they were trying to get the right to ride buses together as a as, as both races combined. They wanted the Native Americans, they shaped the giant the Chinese and Asian Americans. They wanted the Hispanic Americans, Latino Americans, Black Americans, Jewish Americans, and the Angleton Americas to be able to ride together on the same bus sitting next to each other not having the bus segregated in various sections of the bus. When I wrote my little manuscript on Southern Airways, I talked to one of the pilots here who lived in Fort Walton Beach, who started with the company in 1949. He'd been one of the original pilots here for Southern. And I asked Captain Ed about Southern and immigration laws in this time period. And he said that they had a policy at Southern Airways in the 1950s and 1960s and on up until the present time period in our part of Delta, Southern had a policy that if you could buy a Southern Airways ticket, you could sit anywhere on the airplane you wanted to. And he said, oftentimes the black passengers would sit toward the back of the airplane or they would sit up toward the front of the airplane, but they never kind of sat in the middle where, the, where all, most of the white folks sat, that they were kind of mindful of this and they watched their manners pretty closely. They would always say yes or no ma'am and so forth on board their flights. And he said they were free to fly anywhere they wanted to. I've got a film strip, a film collection here of Dr. King flying on Southern. He flies into Greenwood, Mississippi on a Southern DC-3 in 1966. And it shows him getting off the airplane and I noticed the people getting off behind him. There were just as many white folks as there were black folks on that DC-3. And I thought that's very interesting in Greenwood, Mississippi, that you'd have a plane that was so, so mixed with people in this time period of Jim Crow. And so you start to see things change here in this time period. So guys, Mr. Mr. Uh, Kennedy is really interested, or Mr. Robert Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, is interested in civil rights here in this time period. The president is not so outspoken because he's trying to get legislation, and he don't feel like he, he's poking people in the eye with it and bragging about it. He's trying to keep low key. And then another thing the president did, John Kennedy did, is he's going to lower taxes. A Democrat lowering taxes? How crazy is that? Who ever heard of such a situation? Well, it used to happen. It used to happen. Democrats were the ones who tried to make sure the American people had good democracy at a good price. All right. Republicans in this time period were seen to be the extremists. They were always called the most liberal bunch that you cannot trust a Republican as far as you can throw him. That's all here in the South. They would say all that stuff. And you didn't see a lot of trust for us from these Republicans in this time period, okay? And so you start to see some change take place here in America. And of course, John Kennedy lowered taxes. Remember, Eisenhower had raised the tax to an all-time high for the wealthier class. John Kennedy lowered classes, taxes, to try to stimulate the economy. And this is one of the first times you see this. He wants to make sure the post-war boom continues and controlling taxes and interest rates on buying homes and cars played a major role in all of this. Okay, you guys won't believe talking about interest rates. A few years after this, in 1968, I get my first car. The Pontiac Le Mans. It's used, I paid $500 for it, which means I paid about $50 a month car payments. My first car in 1975, I paid $75 a month car payments. The car I just bought, I just paid off early. If I kept on paying on it by monthly, it had been over $500 a month for car payments. But I paid off that sucker and got rid of those car payments. Saved a lot of, a lot of money by doing so. Okay, so guys, interest rates are going to go down along with your taxes. And John Kennedy has found a way to stimulate the economy. Also remember guys, the GI Bill is still being used in this time period. The baby boomers are still being born in this time period, okay? So you still got a lot of growth and expansion going on here in this period of time. Well, Mr. Kennedy is gonna inherit a problem. The problem is called Cuba. Mr. Nixon, thought he had the presidency in the bag. 
he got with the CIA in, in the late 1960 and decided to plan an invasion of Cuba. He's going to use Cuban refugees. You know, we had thousands of people in Cuba who fled when Fidel Castro took over. They hijacked airplanes and came to Miami. They went through and made, got inner tubes together and made big, huge floating uh, boats out of inner tubes. Some people tried to swim that 75 miles out of Cuba to the United States. The Coast Guard picked up thousands of people out here uh, in the, in the uh, down below Key West in, in, uh, in uh, um, Andrews Air Force Base in South Florida. It's a mess. You had a lots and lots of people who fled Cuba and they come into South Florida who's not really prepared for them. And you see a new kind of Jim Crow evolve in South Florida when all these Cubans come in and they start settling. Now this has been all this has been 50 years ago, guys. All this took place. Almost 60 years ago, all this took place. It has been 60 years since all this took place. And so you now people are settled in, they're, they're pretty much getting along, they built their own communities, they built their own societies and so forth here. But in those early years, Miami was a dangerous place. You had a lot of violence, you had a lot of rednecks who didn't like these folks coming in here. You had a lot of problems, guys, in Miami uh, in this time period. Well, Richard Nixon had planned what is called an invasion of Cuba in early 1961. And in April of 1961, we have what is called the Bay of Pigs. They took Cuban refugees and the CIA went down here to invade Cuba to get rid of Fidel Castro. And the United States walked into a trap, a, an embarrassing, an embarrassing trap. The Bay, of, the, the Bay of Pigs, the invasion of the Bay of Pigs was a big failure. President Kennedy did something that no other president had ever done. He had a press conference, a TV press conference. You didn't see TV sets in the Oval Office in the 1950s. Mr. Eisenhower would address us from time to time. But you never saw the workings of the Oval Office on television. It'd be a rare occasion you'd see Mr. Eisenhower on television. Mr. Kennedy comes out the day after the failure at the Bay of Pigs. And he tells the American people, it's all my fault. That we can go through and we can quarterback this from the armchair and try to relive it. But the fact is, we messed up. And I take full blame for it. The first time a president took full blame for a situation like the Bay of Pigs. And President Nixon, I mean, President uh, 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 Kennedy, get the right person here, President Kennedy from then on will do his own press conferences. The man from the top is the man who comes and tells us what's going on. Mr. Kennedy has discovered the power of television that you rein it in and you use it to communicate with the American people. We've been doing radio all this time, but now the television is the main is the main item of communications here in this time period. Okay, now after Francis Gary Powers from the last lecture flew over Moscow and made pictures from his U-2 airplane and made Nikita Khrushchev so mad that he threatened to kill us all that he said, "I will take America in his own time." Mister Mister. Khrushchev is starting to plan all kinds of strategic, strategic maneuvers to make sure that America is kept in line by nuclear weapons. He's going to try to make our minds up for us through nuclear sabotage, through nuclear invasion, if you want to call it that. Okay, so in July of 1961, this is a few months after entering the presidency, Mr. Kennedy is going to increase the national defense budget. He's going to increase it by 25%. Okay, this is July of 1961. Right behind it in August, August 17th, they start building the Berlin Wall between East Berlin and West Berlin. So in, de in defiance of us having this defense act, they're going to start building the Berlin Wall. Okay, now what's going to happen here, guys, is this. 
The Defense Act of 1961 is going to bring a new military arsenal to America. Okay, we will have the Tommy Hawk missiles. We'll have the nuclear missiles and silos all over the middle part of the country. Y'all goes, you guys go to Wyoming and Nebraska. Y'all go to Dakotas, to Kansas, to Idaho, with Wyoming, all these offbeat states, all the ones who are not heavily populated. And you're going to see nuclear silos. We had nuclear missiles in at one time. They were aimed toward the Soviet Union. And we had thousands of them. The Soviet Union had thousands of them. China, concerned about both the United States and Russia, they had a thousand of them. So you have close to 10,000 or more nuclear missiles around the earth. NATO countries had them. It's going to be a mess here. We could literally blow the earth apart. Now let's go to the alien channel on television called the History Channel. Have y'all been watching what they've been saying about Mars? They believe there's life on Mars? That our life here on earth came from Mars because Mars was destroyed by nuclear weapons. It blew out the atmosphere. There are two sites they're looking at here on the, on the surface of Mars that look like nuclear explosions had taken place. And they believe the civilization on Mars had left and came to Earth because of nuclear war that blew out their atmosphere. This is concern here today. This is why I was ducking and covering in fourth grade and fifth grade, getting ready for a nuclear explosion at any time. That's why mother filled the bathtub full of water at night. So we'd have drinking water in case of a nuclear war overnight, not knowing that nobody's gonna be left alive. It's gonna blow out the atmosphere of earth and we're all gonna be gone. You know, they told us just to close your eyes. There'll be a little flash and you'll be all right. Yeah, you'll be little angels flying about earth. You know, it's just really interesting about this time period and how people had this fake news about what could happen to us in this time period. I'm surprised that any of us are sane from the 1960s. All these little kids born between 1945 and 1970, I'm surprised they're even sane from all the mess we had to deal with and all the torture we had to deal with. And I want to tell you, the pandemic, the CV-19 we're having is nothing compared to what it was in this, in this time period here of a nuclear war happening. It was just totally a crazy place here in this time period. In 1962, another problem arises. In the 1950s, both Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower were looking at a little country below China that's called Vietnam. Vietnam has been plagued by the French ever since colonialism started in the 1860s. And the people of Vietnam were tired of the French and how they mistreated them. Yes, they brought a Jim Crow system into, into Vietnam during this time period. In 1919, while President Wilson was in Paris, Ho Chi Minh from, from Vietnam, a young 28-year-old, wanted to talk to the president about how to handle the French in Vietnam and get them out of there. And President Wilson would not talk to him. He had no concern over, over Vietnam. Well, as early as 1954, we're sending advisors in to look at the situation in Vietnam. We're sending advisors trying to advise the South Vietnamese how to handle the problem with the North Vietnamese who are going communist. You know, at the same time period that Iraq, no, I'm sorry, Iran had, a, had an election that took place in 54. The man who won the who won the Iranian election, we did not like him because he threatened to make sure we did not get our oil supply from Iran. So the CIA goes in here and they produce a coup and gets rid of him. The elected president, elected by the people of Iran in a normal democratic election is going to be displaced by the CIA of the United States. 
maybe like Russia coming over here and displacing Mr. Biden from the presidency and let Trump have four more years. They should have never involved themselves in the elections of Iran. But we brought in a friend whose name was Pablo. His name, he we call him the Shah of Iran. And he becomes the leader of Iran until 1979 when he develops, I should say 1978, when he develops prostate cancer. He comes to America for treatment, ends up going to Mexico for alternative treatment where he dies. And when he leaves Iran, here come the fundamentalist Iranian leadership that was displaced in 1954. The leader was called Ayatollah Khomeini. And they bring back the fundamentalist Muslim rule of Iran. And of course, from there, they're going to capture our people in this, in the uh, embassy in Tehran and hold them captive for 444 days. They ruined the presidency of Jimmy Carter. Richard Nixon, I'm sorry, Ronald Reagan becomes a new president because of the Iranian hostage crisis. Okay, we should have kept our butts out of Vietnam and out of Iran. We had no business being there. But the French wanted our help in the 1950s. Well, by 1962, guess who abandons us in Vietnam? The French do. They leave. And we're left holding this bag full of cats. And what do you do with them? How do you handle them? Okay, it's going to be a, it's going to be a major mess here, guys, starting in 1962. In 1963, the president has sent some soldiers over to, over to Vietnam, but he's about to come to the conclusion it's not worth the effort. The best thing to do is not even get involved in Vietnam, re remove all of our troops and just forget about it. Okay, that's part of his stance here in this time period. Okay, well guys, in October of 1962, October the 14th, 1962, from Homestead Air Force Base, by the way, we had U-2 planes that would fly over Cuba, like hurricane planes do and during hurricane season, they fly to Kiesler, they fly to Eglin, they fly to McDill, and they fly to Homestead. And we did have several U-2s here uh, at Eglin. I remember seeing one take off over the house in 1966. I was in high school, and I live exactly a mile from the end of the runway at Eglin. When I saw that plane come over the house, he's already about 2,000 feet up. I mean, he climbed extremely quickly for an airplane. And of course, they flew at 80,000 feet. They made photographs. They developed the pictures. And then they decide targets to hit from the U-2 photographs here. This is, this is between the 353rd Observation Squadron of World War II. You have the U-2 planes in the 19, late 50s, early 60s into the 70s. I'm sure there's probably still, still a few U-2 planes out there. All right. And then we go from there to satellites. And that's why you guys have Google Earth. That's why you guys have, have uh, you can go through and get on Google Earth and look at all the interstate highways and all the towns and, and all this stuff. Look at your parents' house and your property and so forth from Google Earth. So that's all part of the new system now. Okay. Well, guys, in October the 14th, 1962, a U-2 airplane is shot down over Cuba. Okay. It's October the 14th. We send more U-2s over Cuba, wonder how come they shot down our airplane and we found all these nuclear silos. Russia was building nuclear silos all over Cuba. We had done the same thing in the late 1950s in Turkey. All right, as a matter of fact, one of the ladies in my, my history class at the library was the babysitter of of, of Gary Powers, the one who got shot down over Moscow. And I gave her a whole couple of weeks to tell about her experiences in Turkey. And she said, yeah, we had nuclear weapons there. We had U-2 airplanes there. Said everybody that I babysat for were involved in all of this. Yeah, I heard all the stories and knew what was going on down here in 1961 and 1962. The funniest thing is that Roseanne went on to, went on to become a nurse and she was a nurse for Lyndon Johnson. 
So you never know who you're going to run into when it comes to these American presidents. I asked her, I said, what do you remember most about, about Lyndon Johnson? She said, there's two things. He loved to walk around naked. He didn't like wearing clothes too much. And he had a very potty mouth. He had a very potty mouth. And she said he also had lots of girlfriends. He had lots of mistresses. So y'all think about what's going on today in the presidency, and you realize it's all kept secret by the press because they would not expose these presidents and what they were up to in their private lives. Okay? Well, guys, once we have found these nuclear silos in Cuba, we realize Russia is bringing nuclear weapons down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean heading to Cuba. We have what is called the Cuban Missile Crisis. October the 22nd, 1962, President Kennedy came on television from the Oval Office and told the American people the threat we had in Cuba. A lot of his advisors, like Robert, Mc like Robert McNamara, the head of the Defense Department, he wanted us to go and bomb Cuba off the face of the earth. We realize if we bomb Cuba, we're going to have nuclear warheads come in from Russia. That was not an option. Then they decided they wanted to send the Navy out into the Atlantic Ocean in international waters and violate international law and attack those Russian ships with those missiles. Well, that again would cause a nuclear attack out of Russia. So President Kennedy gets a hotline, it's going to be called the Red Line, established between Washington, D.C. and Moscow. And he decides to talk to Nikita Khrushchev. And these two men are going to forge a kind of a friendship during this time period over the telephone. And Mr. Kennedy is going to convince Mr. Mr a Khrushchev to turn his ships back to Cuba, back to Russia and forget about putting missiles in Cuba. And John Kennedy told him, I will take every nuclear warhead out of any country you want me to, to do this. And the main concern was Turkey. It's the closest ones to it. Okay. You got to consider it, guys. You shot a warhead off in Cuba and these, these warheads go 15,000 miles an hour. But they'll be in Washington, D.C. in about 35 minutes. You don't have any time to prepare to shoot one of these things down. There's no way. Same thing from Turkey, from Istanbul. You shoot it off toward Moscow. You don't have a very short period of time before, you, before it'll be hitting you. You don't have much time, okay, to, to get prepared for a nuclear missile. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Things all broke out at school. We got totally crazy. The courthouse in Crestview had a basement in it. We lived in Crestview during this time period. The courthouse in Crestview had a basement in it. And the basement was turned into a self into a into a uh, a nuclear defense bunker. We were told if the, if if they we get warnings and did have sirens on, on your water towers, you had your fire siren, then you had your nuclear siren. We did have nuclear tests in Crestview. The siren would go up and people pull their, pull their cars to the side of the road. They'd get out of the cars and lay in ditches. If they're in Main Street and Crestview, they go into storefronts, abandon the cars on Main Street. They head to the courthouse. Us school kids would duck around the walls and duck and cover like Myrtle the Turtle. And we had these pretty regularly, guys. We had them pretty regularly that in this time period. So we were very concerned about all of this stuff. You know, also in 1962, we had a tornado hit Crestview. And by having the civil, the civil defense practices that nobody got killed in this tornado, that we knew how to handle ourselves in emergencies because of this. So there was some payoff on all of this in this time period. But we figured that we're not going to be here much longer. You went to church, all you heard was sermons about nuclear explosions. I went to church one, one, one Wednesday night in Crestview, it was 1962, and some gentleman who was traveling through town decided to come to our prayer meeting. And the Crestview Baptist Church had a pretty good sized prayer meeting. We usually had about 150 people, 200 people there in church on Wednesday nights. They fed us, we had our training, we had, we had our uh, GAs and RAs, our, our programs. They had Bible study for the adults, and then we had our prayer meeting, which usually would get through about eight o'clock. 
And about 730, this man stood in the middle of the congregation and, and interrupted the preacher. And he says, I want to tell you guys, I have been studying the book of Daniel. And the end of time is at near. It'll be here in 1966. In 1966, it's going to be a major war between Egypt and Israel, which we did have, by the way. And from this war is going to be nuclear weapons flying across the earth, destroying major cities, and we will be blown into the atmosphere. We'll be blown away from this nuclear weapons. It scared me. I thought, good Lord, 1966 could be a pretty bad year. Well, it turns out that 2020 was worse than 1966 was by a long shot. Okay, so you had all this going on, preaching at churches, you're going to, that, that their end of the verse is going, to, is going to come and so forth. By the way, guys, after World War II, the American churches exploded in size. Everybody went to church. If you went at church on Sunday morning, you got three phone calls on Monday morning wanting to know where you were and who was sick in your household. That's how bad it was. They kept tabs on who was not at church and they called. And they had visitation on, on Tuesday nights. And they'd go around visiting folks or, and on Monday nights. And they would go and visit folks trying to get into the church. Those are not attending. America wanted 100% church attendance. And that's among all your denominations. They were trying to find ways. You know, they sent us after the Baptist Church here in Valparaiso to inventory the city of Valparaiso and ask each family what church they went to. Little old, nine -year -old, nine, uh, little old naive David, who's about 15 years old, took it all seriously. And I was out there with my, with my notepad and my, and my clipboard and my pencils and the whole nine yards and, eat, and write down each address we went to and put down Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, whatever. Okay? So it's really an interesting situation here in this time period that America was very much churchgoers. Do y'all know everything on Sundays was shut down? We had the blue laws on Sunday. Nothing was open on Sundays. They'd open the pharmacy up early on Sunday morning. When church started, they closed the pharmacy. That's for people who got sick over the weekend. About four o'clock in the afternoon, they'd open up the ice house. Ice was seen as being a necessity during this time period. And the ice house also sold colas and so forth. People would go to the ice house in the afternoons and they would go and have their big front porch parties, you know. And uh, us kids, we'd go to church and come home to a big party at the house. Sometimes we had our own little parties, you know. And we'd go by the ice house, get the ice, get the colas and the whole nine yards and have our parties. You know, we had junior food stores, but they were closed on Sundays. Could y'all imagine that? You couldn't even go in and buy, buy a pack of cigarettes on Sunday. You couldn't get nothing on Sunday. So you had to make sure you had everything pro provided. When I was going to school to Ole Miss, Lafayette County, Mississippi was dry on Sunday. You couldn't buy liquor on Sunday. And you see a whole car, you see car after car to car leaving Oxford, going to Memphis, to Tennessee to buy liquor because they ran out at 4 o'clock and they wanted liquor for the 6 o'clock party. So Sundays was a crazy day here with these blue laws. And I think sometime we were better off with the blue laws. At least everybody had a day off together, you know? So it's interesting you look at all this stuff and what took place that you guys didn't even realize was going on during this time period, okay? Well, guys, in July of 1963, Nikita Khrushchev and, and President Kennedy have decided to meet each other. They've been on the phone, you know. If they'd had email, they'd been emailing each other. If they had Facebook, they'd be Facebooking each other. But all they had was that hotline between Moscow and, and Washington, D.C. And President Kennedy and, and Premier of Russia, Nikita Khrushchev, decided to meet in Paris. Okay, this is July of 1963. This is called the, the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Now, here's what's interesting. When they arrived in Paris, Jacqueline went absolutely crazy buying clothes in Paris. All these designers were here and so forth, and she was in her atmosphere. She was in her place where she wanted to be. Well, she looked good. She always looked like a fashion model. And when Nikita Khrushchev saw her, his friendship with John Kennedy got even deeper. 
And John Kennedy says, well, I went to Paris, but the one, I, the one who made all the deals here was Jacqueline because everybody liked her more than they liked me. Nikita Khrushchev loved Jacqueline Kennedy. It reminds me a lot, guys, if y'all been watching recent politics, that George W. Bush is really big buddies with Michelle Obama. Have y'all noticed that? And in this time period, Nikita Khrushchev was big friends of Jacqueline Kennedy. And so it's interesting how these two people from opposite sides forge these friendships. Well, we're human, guys, and we should forge these friendships. Do y'all know that in the 1960s that the people in Congress, both the House and the Senate, lived in Washington, D.C.? They bought houses here. They moved their families here. Their kids went to the same schools. They were in the same classrooms. You have Republican mamas and Democratic mamas who are homeroom mamas for these kids in their classrooms. They live next door to each other. They had barbecues together. They ate dinner together. They ate lunch together while, while in Congress. They'd go out together to eat together. Didn't think a thing about it. These folks forged friendships that went across politics that got things done. It made a difference. They were not enemies of each other. They were American freedom people, freedom fighters. You want to call them that? Be good. Be a good term. They were concerned about American freedom and how to help the American people. What in the world happened? Well, in the nineteen eighties, here comes the moral majority in with Ronald Reagan, extremely religious bunch that Jerry Falwell, the president of Liberty University started the moral majority and all these southerners began to join the moral majority and became republicans and they thought richard nixon was a christ figure well richard i'm not sorry not ronald reagan they thought ronald reagan was a christ figure well ronald reagan, reagan was not really religious he didn't go to church and yet all these christians these fundamentalists back up ronald reagan he can do no wrong he can do no wrong. Well, then right behind him is present. You have Mr. George Herbert Walker Bush, and he expands the fundamental Christians because he thinks they're a good organization for American morality and so forth. But Mr. Bush gets beaten by Bill Clinton, a Democrat. Republican Party can't stand it that their man was beaten by this gentleman who had all kinds of, of extramarital affairs and so forth from Arkansas. Well, y'all look at Ronald Reagan and what he was up to, all right? There's some horrible stories about him and Nancy, and Nancy Davis, his, his, his wife, Nancy Reagan. There's some horrible stories what they were up to in Hollywood in the 1950s and 1960s. Even as the governor of California, Mr. Mr. Reagan had some issues to deal, to deal with, all right? And here comes Bill Clinton. They can't stand that Bill Clinton won the election. In 1995, Newt Gingrich, Speaker of the House, out of Georgia, is going to put together what is called a contract for the American people. That he wants to bring a mor morality back to the American political scene. And he goes after Bill Clinton. And Mr. Gingrich decides the best thing that America can do is for the people in the House and the Senate not to live in D.C., to get apartments and to get townhouses, even live in their offices, and don't even consider meeting or having conversations with the other side. He told Republicans, don't have anything to do with Democrats. And now you have what we have today. When they lived next door to each other and they had their barbecues, they played golf with each other, they went out, they went out bowling with each other. They'd come over in the afternoons for cocktails and discuss what's going on in the House and the Senate and, and express their opinions. America worked. That's why I keep telling you guys, we've got to get back to the front porch mentality. When this virus finally ever comes to an end, and we're all safe again, we need to start visiting each other. We need to know our neighbors and who they are, invite them to our front porches for ice cream socials and for cocktails and for finger foods and desserts 
I mean, what's wrong with cake and coffee at four o'clock with your neighbors? Lord, I vote for that any day. You know? We've got to come back as we once had been. And this right here were the golden ages, guys. Even though we got Vietnam starting and we got the civil rights movement beginning here, these are actually good times in America. The bad times don't come until 1968. That's where it all changes. If you guys had lived in 1950 America, y'all would absolutely love it. It's a whole different place than it is today. And people who are not paying attention to the 1950s and the 1960s were not ready for the 1970s and 1980s. Okay? So this is a very important time period, guys, in American history. Okay? And Lyndon and, and Mr. Kennedy and Mr. Mr. Um, Khrushchev be here in Paris for this arms limitation talk, and they do make progress. They have planned for more talks in the future. All right, then here comes the first of November of 1963, just a few months after, just a few months after this, this test bans treaty. In November of 63, the American and Vietnamese forces stage a coup in Vietnam. This is in the South. We have no confidence in the president of South Vietnam. We try to pull the same trick that was pulled in Iran in 1954. It did not work. The coup did not work. All right. So therefore, President Kennedy is going to order the assassination of the president of South Vietnam. And here on November the 1st, 1963, during this coup attempt, the CIA is going to shoot and kill the president of South Vietnam. And from that day onward, we owned Vietnam. We totally destabilized their entire government. Stupidest thing we could have done. Mr. N Mr. Kennedy was considering withdrawing from Vietnam, but now it's ours to deal with. Okay, October the 21st, 1963, it's a Thursday. Mr. Kennedy, his wife, Jacqueline, the Vice President and Johnson, his wife, Lady Bird Johnson are gonna get on Air Force One at Andrews Air Force Base and they fly down to Houston. In Houston, Texas, the President gives several speeches at NASA. All right, then they fly over to San Antonio they dedicated a new space facility. They spent the night in San Antonio. Friday morning, the 22nd day of November, they got up early, boarded Air Force One, and arrived in Dallas, Texas, about 9.30 in the morning. And here waiting for them was the presidential limousine, a big, huge white limousine that had a glass cockpit top on it, the same kind of glass you saw in an, an aircraft, bullet, bulletproof top. It's already 71 degrees in Dallas that morning. The sun is shining, the sky is blue, there's no chances of rain. And President Kennedy tells them to remove the top off of that limousine that they did not need it. President Kennedy, his wife, Jacqueline, and the governor's wife, Governor Connolly's wife, are going to sit on the back seat of this limousine. Mr. Kennedy sits behind on the passenger side of the car. Jacqueline sat in the middle. Mrs. Conley sat behind the driver. On the front seat in the, in the passenger side is going to be Governor Conley. And the car behind them is going to be Lyndon Johnson and Lady Bird. There'll be several carloads of Secret Service. And generally, they'll be running beside the car as they go through downtown Dallas. They'll switch off from time to time, and they will be next to the presidential car. Okay? Well, they come driving into Dallas, heading to the Mercantile Mark. The Mercantile Market is where you went to go through and buy your clothes and your goods for your stores across the country. Owners of, of, of proprietary stores would go to Dallas or go to Atlanta 
to the Mercantile Mark. There used to be a store here in Niceville, down here where Tropical Smoothie is located in the, in the Dollar General. It was called Skinner's Fashions. Jane and Peggy Skinner owned the store. And I worked for them for a couple of years. And I would go once in a while with their general manager, Greg, and we'd go to Atlanta to the marketplace. We'd fly up on a Sunday morning, go to the market, buy all the stuff you wanted to for the season, and come back that evening. That's what the Mercantile Mart did in, 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 in Dallas. You'd fly over and, and you would spend several days buying the clothing for your store, the shoes, the dresses, the dress shirts, the suits, the whole nine yards. And you bought all the accessories, the jewelry, the cufflinks, all this stuff. Jewelry companies would go and buy their jewelry here. And stores who sold, sold various kinds of knickknacks would go over and buy their, buy their porcelain or their china or whatever figurines they wanted to sell in their stores, bosses and all this kind of stuff, okay? This is a huge, big area here because it's like a convention center. They put out tables and they arranged them so you could walk down the aisles and do your buying. This is a big place. They have decided to have the president speak here at the Mercantile Mark and they put tables all inside this building for lunching. And people are supposed to be there by 12 o'clock noon. Well, by 1030, the president is heading into downtown Dallas. When he comes into downtown area, he comes to what is called Daly Plaza. And here in Daly Plaza is what is known as the Texas Textbook Depository. They, they, they are distributing here textbooks for the schools of Texas. If they got into Daly Plaza and made the turn here, fire shots were fired out of the Texas Depository. John Kennedy was hit in the same place in which President Lincoln was shot by John Wilkes Booth. Okay. That bullet went through the neck of Kennedy and struck the body of Governor Connolly, and he's severely wounded. Another shot is fired. Kennedy's hit again. He slumps over into the lap of the first lady. She's got on an apricot suit that she had purchased. And she looked like a flight attendant in this outfit, by the way. And she slumped over and blood got all over her clothing. Secret Service jumped onto the fender, the back fender of the car and climbed on board as the driver sped off heading to Parkland Hospital. And here they put John Kennedy in the emergency room and they realized the man cannot survive. And at one o'clock in the afternoon, John Kennedy dies. Okay. We kids who were around during 1963 know exactly where we were when John Kennedy died. I was at Ruckel Middle School in a science class. When they were working across the intercom, they dismissed school immediately. The buses came in. We all came home. We came home early. We didn't get home from school just about 3 o'clock. We had to get back home by 1.30, 1 1.45. We were home. Turned on the TV set, and here it all was on television. And for the first time, American television will be 24-7. Before this time, television was started at 6 o'clock in the morning, and they ended up at midnight. And from midnight to 6 o'clock in the morning, you had a test pattern. They usually have an Indian chief's head on your television set. And when the TV went off the air, they played the Star Spangled Banner. When the TV came on the air in the morning, they played the Star Spangled Banner. So you know the TV was on once you heard the Star Spangled Banner being played. Okay, we had news 24 seven. They went through every detail of the assassination, trying to piece a piece, trying to piece it all together, trying to piece it all together. Okay, guys, Kennedy dies. Lyndon Johnson was kept down the hall from the emergency room and he was not told exactly what was going on. And Mr. Johnson was scared that somebody was going to try to deny him the presidency, particularly Bobby Kennedy. So this president, and I don't know how he did this, but this president was on Air Force One by two o'clock and a federal judge 
in her uniform, in her in her black gown, and her hair all made up, and her hair all her face all made, her hair all fixed, is standing there when the limousine brings in Jackie Kennedy. And Lyndon Johnson has Jackie Kennedy brought to the front of the airplane, the front cabin of the airplane. A photographer is standing in the galley of the airplane. The first, the, the first lady and the, the new president are standing in the aisle of the airplane with Lady Bird right next to him. The picture only encompasses Lady Bird, Jacqueline, and Mr. Link, I mean, Mr. Johnson. And here, Johnson is sworn into the presidency. He does not take any chances of waiting till he gets to Washington, D.C. for the Chief Justice, Earl Warren, to swear him in. He does it early with his federal judge out of Dallas. How do you get a federal judge onto an airplane that quickly for inauguration? A lot of folks question that. And they realized he wanted Jackie Kennedy in the picture to make it legitimate. And from this stance, a lot of folks says that Lyndon Johnson had John Kennedy shot and killed. Well, the plane takes off. It flies back to Andrews Air Force Base. It gets there at dark. Lyndon Johnson comes off Air Force One. At the steps, as, as Jacqueline Kennedy comes off, it's standing Robert Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy, and he takes her with the hearse, and they leave the scene. Johnson is left there by himself with Lady Bird at the microphone, and Johnson tells the American people, I need your help, and I need God's. Okay? Strange times here. Well, Nothing much is on television. They're trying to repeat the same old mess. They keep showing the same old film clips over and over and over again like they do today. You know, they do the same thing, trying to trying to make news, trying to make time here, and so forth. And then we get word that a gentleman has been arrested in Dallas that they believe is the one who shot John Kennedy. His name is Lee Harvey Oswald. Lee Harvey Oswald had confrontations with the police officers, which he shot and killed. He was arrested and brought to the Dallas police station. And here they started questioning him. By the way, they found him in a theater. He's hiding in a theater when they found him. So there's a lot of similarities between the Lincoln assassination and the Kennedy assassination. You know, a theater's involved in it. Of course, the one that Oswald was in was a movie theater. And guys, they soon find Oswald as a suspect in the murder of John Kennedy. A weapon he has kind of matches up with the bullet that was used and so forth. It's crazy. All right. By Saturday afternoon, they have charged Oswald with the murder of John Kennedy. Well, across town is a nightclub owner whose name is Jack Ruby. And Jack Ruby is not happy. Now, the rumor is that the police officer that Mr. Oswald has shot was a good friend of, maybe a sexual partner of, Jack Ruby. He owned a strip joint out there, out toward the airport, and it was kind of a sleazy area. And Mr. Ruby was known for being involved with the mob. Well, on Sunday morning, they decided to take Oswald to the federal courthouse and charge him officially with murder. They decided to bring a Brinks truck in to carry him to the hearing. Well, the Brinks truck would not go into the opening, into the into the into the basement of the Dallas police station, and so they decided to walk Lee Harvey Oswald across the parking deck under the under the police station to the Brinks truck that was on the slope outside of the building on the main street. Well, they brought Lee Harvey Oswald out. He's handcuffed. There's a police officer that has their arms inside of his arms. And he walks into a crowd of reporters and all of a sudden a gun appears. And at point blank range, Lee Harvey Oswald is shot several times. 
I want to tell you something. If you're shot by a 45 caliber pistol, there's going to be a blood spray. We didn't see any blood. It looked like a gun smoke shooting on the Western gun smoke. Or on, or on the big soap opera that was called As the World Turns in this time period. They brought an ambulance in. They loaded up Lee Harvey Oswald on a white gurney that was filled with white sheets and still no blood. They hauled him off to Parkland Hospital where he dies in the same emergency room that John Kennedy died in. Mr. Ruby is arrested and charged with the murder of Lee Harvey Oswald. And so this big, huge shooting of John Kennedy becomes a major farce. We don't know who killed Kennedy. We don't know what's going on here. The news media is running its mouth trying to make up stuff. And by the way, guys, before John Kennedy was shot and killed, your evening news from NBC, CBS, and ABC was a 15-minute news program. You had an hour for news. You had, you had 45 minutes for local news, sports and weather. Then you had 15 minutes of national news. After John Kennedy's shooting, the nightly news goes to 30 minutes. So then you start having 30 minutes of local news, then 30 minutes of national news. And then our time period, you got it all, dang, all dead gum day long. The news is always on, it seems like. Channel 5 and Channel 3 and Channel 10 all start news at 4 o'clock. You got news from 4 o'clock until, until 7 o'clock, especially on, on Channel 5. It's like, good Lord, people, how much news we need to have. All right? It gets really crazy here. All right? So the big question is, who killed John Kennedy? A lot of folks said that Fidel Castro has been involved in it. Fidel Castro wanted Kennedy out of the way because he's worried about an invasion from the United States. Some folks said the mob was involved in it because Bobby Kennedy went against them in 1962, and they have John Kennedy get elected in 1960. Then a lot of folks said that Lyndon Johnson was involved in it, that he wanted to expand the Vietnam War because Texas had a lot of military industries that could benefit from a big war. Remember, Eisenhower warned the American people in January of 1960 as he left office, be, or 61 rather, be wary of the military industrial complex. And they think Lyndon Johnson got in with the industrialists to expand the military to go to Vietnam. And I want to tell you something, the Johnsons made millions of dollars off of Vietnam. They put all the money in the family in the name of Lady Bird but the president didn't have any assets during the presidency, and she made lots of money off the presidency. Interesting things here, guys. All right? So a lot of folks thought the president was involved. Some people said the president was involved with the mafia on all this stuff. But I want you to think that's interesting about all this. Those people who were standing are sitting along the grassy knoll where John Kennedy was assassinated, disappeared. Some died in car wrecks. Some died through poisoning. Some people were stabbed and were murdered. Some of these folks died from cancer and from other diseases. But by 1966, all the people who witnessed, directly witnessed the shooting of John Kennedy died. A lot of these folks said they heard shots from behind them. They didn't come from the Texas Depository. It came from behind them. There's a lot of questions about how John Kennedy died, and we still have no answers about it. Okay? Some people said that John Kennedy did, did not die. He was left vegetated. And so, therefore, they put him on life support. But, you know, in 1966, Jacqueline Kennedy married a millionaire out of Greece whose name was Anassas. He's a big, huge shipping migrant, made his money off of getting old surplus World War II ships in the United States on a nickel on a dollar, built a big, huge shipping empire, and he married Jacqueline. And people said that Jacqueline married him because she needed money to keep John Kennedy on life support. 
So you have all these rumors going around during this time period of what really happened here in 1963, the assassination of John Kennedy. Okay. Finally, they brought in Earl Warren, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and you have what is called the Warren Commission. And they totally investigated what took place here, guys. What took place here in the assassination of John Kennedy. And they came to the conclusion here that everything that we had learned through the news media was true. That John, that John, I think that, that Lee Harvey Oswald shot Kennedy from the text of the book, book to Depository. There's nobody else involved, just one shooter. That Jack Ruby shot Oswald in revenge. And so the whole thing turns into a farce. CBS did not believe it. CBS News did not believe it. They went and had their own investigation and came to the same conclusion. Well, guys, it takes 72 years before the truth will come out of what took place in 1964. Okay? It'll be 60 years in 2024 or 2023. Okay? So it's going to be in the 2040s before we finally find out what really happened here, guys, to Mr. Kennedy. You see, guys, federal private information is kept secret for 72 years. Your federal census reports are kept secret for 72 years. The 1950 federal census comes out in 2022. Okay? So, guys, you have all this going on during this time period. And people don't know what's happening here. It is crazy. Lyndon Johnson becomes your new president. He wanted to be president. He hated the vice presidency. He wanted to be president, but he didn't want to get it in this way. Well, guys, it turns out that we, that we find out that John Kennedy had some major ailments. He had Atkinson's disease, which is a crippling disease. He had back problems. As a, as a young guy in the, night, in the late 1940s, he almost died because of all the inflictions that he had, all the ailments that he had. And we now realize that John Kennedy would have died probably in his second administration. He'd been reelected in 1963 or 1964, rather, that he would have probably died by 1966, and Lyndon Johnson would have gotten the presidency by that time period. All right? Lyndon Johnson had plans to run for the presidency after Kennedy had served eight years. But here he comes in here, guys, a thousand days into Camelot. Here comes Lyndon Johnson as your president. Okay. Now I want to kind of switch areas here and go back to what's going on in the civil rights movement during this time period. In 1960, we had the big sit-in strikes with the men with the, the college kids from North Carolina State, the kids from all across the South, mostly black kids, uh, some of your white progressive kids would go to the lunch counters of, of these big huge uh, drug stores and keep people from ordering their lunches to, to make sure the lunch counters could be integrated. By the spring of 1960, this had taken place. The lunch counters across the South have been integrated. In 1961, you had the sit-in, you had the, the, uh, the Freedom Rides. The Freedom Rides are going to start on May the 4th, 1961. What they did was, this is part of SNCC and part of the, uh, of the, um, it's part of SNCC and part of CORE that did this. CORE was founded in Chicago in 1942. That's a, that's a racial equality group. Uh, the uh, SNCC is a nonviolent coordinating committee for your college kids, not to be, be, be nonviolent. They came together, and here in May of 1961, they're going to charter a Trailways bus and a Greyhound bus. And on board these buses, they're going to put mixed people. They're going to put people from every different racial group on board these buses. All these ethnic groups will be on the same bus riding side by side. They're going to test the law of the interstate bus service. Now, I want to tell you guys, the interstate highways are being built during this time period, but the interstate is nowhere being finished. 
you don't see the interstates being really complete until 1975. It's going to take about 20 years to build all these interstates. So when you leave Washington, D.C., you're getting off the interstate on the Highway 1 and back on the interstate and then back on Highway 1 again. When you get to Raleigh, you'll get on interstate, you'll get on interstate 20, 85, which is still not finished, and you get off and on a Highway 70 going across here. And when you get to Atlanta, you're going on back roads all the way down to Birmingham, Alabama. There's no interstates finished down here yet. And so you're going from interstate highways getting cut off onto old U.S. highways. Okay, the U.S. highways go through small towns. So there's going to be a lot of disruption when these buses come rolling through these towns. When the buses arrive in Atlanta, Georgia, a riot breaks out. And the Attorney General, Bobby Kennedy, is going to send the marshals in here to put down this violence. A couple of days later, they leave Atlanta heading to Birmingham. They come into a little place called Anniston, Alabama. And in Anniston, Alabama, they are attacked by people on the back of pickup trucks who have got Monocoff cocktails. These are Coke bottles filled with gasoline with cloth wicks in them. A Coca-Cola a Coca bottle can break out a window in a bus, which means they set the lead bus on fire. They pull the bus out of the road. These guys in pickup trucks jump off the trucks. They got they got baseball bats. They got wood. They got two by fours. They got pipes. They got all kinds of instruments of destruction, and they start beating on these people coming off that first bus. And these folks finally make their way to the second bus, and they take off. They leave. Right behind these buses is a carload of FBI agents in which J. Edgar Hoover had put there to take notes. And he told them, don't do anything to stop violence. They just sat there and watched it all take place. When the bus arrives at Birmingham, there are several people who are severely beaten. One man had, had major brain injury. He was in the hospital for months in Birmingham. They kind of regrouped themselves and came down to Montgomery, Alabama. In Montgomery, there were a thousand people at the bus station waiting for the bus to come in. And here a riot breaks out. Bobby Kennedy again brings in the map, the marshals, and they put down what's going on here in Montgomery. Then the bus leaves and goes to Jackson, Mississippi, the most, the most racist state in the nation. The governor's name is Ross Barnett. I got some ties with Ross Burnett through my dad. My dad went to Mississippi College in the late 1940s, and the girl that Ross Bar Barnett married was one of dad's best friends. And they never could understand what she saw in that racist Ross Barnett. She's a good Christian Baptist woman, and she married Ross Barnett. And dad told me he met old Ross a couple of times. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. Good for you. <laughs> it really impressed me a whole lot about Ross Barnett. Ross Barnett had buses waiting, big, nice, luxury buses waiting for the Freedom Riders. He says, you kids get off this bus. I got some box lunches on board this bus. There's a big old thing for the Coca-Colas in there on ice. Y'all get in that bus, and I'm going to carry y'all to a grand hotel. We're going to treat y'all just as fine as we can treat you here in Mississippi. These kids got on board that bus. Officers were on board the bus, and the bus headed right to Parchman Prison up in Mississippi Delta. Parchment Prison is one of the worst prison systems in the United States. And these kids were locked up and were forced to do agricultural jobs out here, the convict lease system, out here at Parchment. Word got out what happened to all these folks, and more college kids came into Jackson. The goal was to fill Parchment Prison so full of college kids that they could not afford to keep them. And it worked. They were released because they could not afford them here. In 1962, you'll have you'll have you'll have uh, Mr. James Meredith try to enroll the University of Mississippi. Mr. Meredith is a veteran of the United States Air Force. October the first, 1962, Ross Burnett is going to have a war break out in Oxford. He tells all Mississippians, "If you got a squirrel rifle, y'all head to Oxford and save our great University of Ole Miss from the radical left." who wants Mr. Meredith in our school, that we'll never integrate our school. Bobby Kennedy sends in the marshals. 
He also, of course, he also is going to talk about sending in the 101st Airborne Division. And they put down this problem here. They put down these problems here at Ole Miss. And James Meredith is now allowed to enter the University of Mississippi. Okay? June the 12th, 1963. I hope you guys have seen a movie called Mississippi Burning. It deals with this information I'm giving you right now. If you guys go to your videos that are on Blackboard, you will see this information on there. You'll see the actual film clips. You'll see what took place. You'll see what I saw in this time period. And I look for particularly what I remember from this time period. Remember, I was 12 years old in this time period. I was 11 and 12 years old, 13 and 14 during this time period. I remember all this stuff pretty vividly. On June the 12th, 1963, Brian D. Beckwith from Greenwood, Mississippi is gonna drive down to Jackson and he's gonna pull across the street and park his car in front of Megger Evers' house. Megger Evers is the NAAC field secretary for Mississippi. Been out on the, he'd been out across the state working, and he comes home in, at late that evening, around, around 8 o'clock. He pulls into his open carport, gets out of his car, and heads to the door where his wife and children are standing with the door open to hug and kiss their father and their husband. As a man makes his way toward the door, Byron D. Beckwith is going to open fire, and he shoots and kills Megger Edwards. The FBI is called in here by Robert Kennedy. And he wants all this inspected. The FBI didn't want to do it. Mr. Hoover did not like Dr. King. He said Dr. King was a communist, but he's going to ruin America. Anything but that. All right? But they forced the FBI to put informants into the Ku Klux Klan to find out who shot Megger Evers. And they charged Brian Diesel back with for the murder. But they had two trials, and hung juries kept him from being found guilty. Okay? They tried Mississippi Law on him first, and they had two different areas they could try him in. You can't try a person for the same crime. You got to go through and find different areas to do it with. All right? Violating civil rights was one of them. But the federal group did not have anything to do with it. Okay? Well, guys, in the Fall of 19, in the fall of 1993, the Attorney General of Mississippi obtains the rifle that shot was used to shoot and kill Megger Evers. And they have proof that Brian D. Beckwith owned the gun. It all went back to Brian D. Beckwith. And in January of 1994, in Oxford, Mississippi, they bring, they bring Brian Diva back with, in front of the federal court of Oxford. I'm at school at Ole Miss during this time period. I remember going downtown to the post office, couldn't find a place to park because the federal courthouse was right across the street from the, from the post office. I had to go and park downtown in parallel parking, walk about 10 blocks back up to, to the post office to buy a dang stamp. All right, see, we don't have email or, or this stuff during this time period. I just couldn't, I couldn't send it by the internet. I had to mail it. And I walked up there and they had all these electronic devices that they scanned us with to make sure we didn't have weapons. This is a crazy place up here. And here Brian Diva back with in 1994 was charged with the murder of Megger Evers that took place in 1963. It took over 20 years to get this man. I remember, I remember being, being around the, uh, the apartment complex and, and being at school in my different classes and being in the cafeteria and so forth. And these little kids, these little, these little kids who are 18 years old, why are they trying this poor old white man? He's going to die pretty soon. Why aggravate him with this? I said, guys, he committed murder. He's finally getting his just reward. Let him go ahead and be in parchment prison for the rest of his life, and then he can kick over, open the doors of hell. Don't sit there and worry about this old man. Fate has finally caught up with him. It gets really crazy. 
Okay, a few months, a few weeks later, or actually a couple months later, on August the 28th, Dr. King is going to have what is called the Great March on Washington, D.C. The Great March on Washington, D.C. This is the second attempt they've had for a march for the personal freedoms of Black Americans. The first march was planned in 1941. A. Philip Randolph was a president of the Stephen Carporters Union. And Mr. Randolph wants to have a, have a march march in D.C. to make sure that black industries will have war jobs, will be manufacturing war machines. You see, guys, in 1940, during this selective service time period, act time period, they only allowed white industrialists to supply war machines. And Ray, and, and A. Randolph, and A. Randolph, and A Randolph Phillips, or A. Philip Randolph, get his name right, he decided to have a strike, a march, Washington, D.C., to show the support for Black Americans. And he had close to 200,000 people ready to come, Washington, D.C., on July the 4th, 1941. President Roosevelt realized there could be a major problem here. And so he signs an executive order that orders that all manufacturing be done by all the American manufacturers, regardless of their ethnic background. So Mr. Roosevelt cut off the march before the march could happen by an executive order. Well, here, President Kennedy did not do that. President Kennedy allowed the march to take place on August the 28th, 1963. I want to tell you something, guys. These folks across the South, they got their money together. They took school buses to Washington, D.C. Okay? They're going, to, they're going to send school buses to Washington, D.C. They're going to take personal automobiles to Washington, D.C. They're going to char charter airliners to go to Washington, D.C. They're going to take trains to Washington, D.C. And you're going to have here, guys, over 200 50,000 people arrive here for the March on Washington, D.C. That's totally amazing. That's totally amazing. And here Dr. King gave his great speech. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of his creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. All people are created equal. We'll be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, when all of God's children, he identifies God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics. He does not leave anybody out of this. Janus, Buddhist, Islamic, Muslim, Catholics, Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians, that all these people, that when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, you're free at last. That's a word for America today. We got to come together as our people had once been and join hands between Republicans and Democrats and between Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterians and Church of God and Jewish people and the people from the temples and the people from the synagogues and the people from the mosque. Join hands and realize that we are the American people. And that nobody shall ever tear us apart. And I go back to George Washington's address to the American people. George Washington had been very proud of this speech here, guys. And you know, there's a young man who's 20 year old in the in the in the in, the, in, the, in this area. He also gave a speech. His name was was his name was John Lewis. He just passed away here recently. He's from Troy, Alabama. And a whole new, a whole new generation is going to come forth trying to make America great. 
not great again, but great. Makes a big difference here. You know, I remember going to the barber shop that weekend. It was on a Saturday, this all took place. And here in Knoxville at the barber shop, I heard old white men saying, they need to get the air, the eighth air force out there and bomb the hell out of these folks. They're all a bunch of communists. I'm like, my God, will America ever get rid of its old Jim Crow and its old white supremacy and the old notion that little old white men who are on the grave have this much influence? We realize it's gonna be the young people who makes the change. We let that barbershop and dead said, you boys forget about all that crap. I thought it was a bunch of crap. He says, I went through and fought in World War II for American freedom, I fought for everybody. And I hate hearing these old people out here talk about, about, about of these people, these black Americans and the way they do. He says, you boys forget about that mess, don't even consider it. It is not important. Those boys who went through World War II, these white boys, they made a big influence, guys. They were not vocal. They they could not be vocal among their among the people, or they'd be ridiculed. They'd be, they they would be they would be what they'd call blackball during this time period. But inside, they did write checks. They did send money. They did support the black movement in this time period. You know, I remember just during the same time period, we had a group of, of African-Americans who had formed a little, a little church group, a little, a little Bible study group at Eglin. There's about 25 people in the group and they wanted permission to come to our church. Wanted permission to come to the First Baptist Church of Valparaiso, Florida. And they came with no problem. We decided that maybe the church should vote and we should allow black members in the church. And I'm like, Jesus does not care who's in his church. Why are we voting to let black members into our church? And there were four or five old guys that did not want to see it happen. They got crude in church. They got bad manners in church. And I remember my dad standing up and defending these people from Eglin who wanted to come to church if I'll be Baptist. But he stood and told them that God does not care of your color of your skin. We're all the same. This is for DNA, guys. And those old men got mad because the church voted to allow these folks, and the vote was over 90%. And we allowed these folks to become part of our church and our church got better. The music improved immensely. The sermons improved immensely. The fellowship improved immensely because these folks came and started being a part of our church that was integrated and not a Jim Crow church. You know, it's sad to say, guys, in America this morning, on Sunday mornings, on Sunday mornings, the church, the most integrated, the most integrated place in America. We've got to change all of this stuff. We've got to come together again. I mean, it's make everybody inclusive, okay, and not exclusive, okay? So this all took place September the 15th, 1963. They're getting ready for church in downtown Birmingham at the 16th Avenue Baptist Church. The girls' choir is going to sing. These are little girls from the ages of six to about age 14. They're down in the basement of the church, get putting on their choir uniforms. And a bomb goes off. This bomb is going to kill four little girls here at the 16th Avenue Baptist Church. Birmingham, Alabama is the most destructive city when it comes to civil rights. Their police chief is a racist from the first degree. He would turn water hoses on children who are protesting and cut up their backs. He would set, he's had to have a loose German Shepherd and attack dogs on groups of people who are protesting. He believed that people should not have freedom because it's for white folks. And this mom goes off in this church and it kills these little girls. And this really kind of changes the movement here in this time period. Okay, it's pretty serious in this time period. 
You know, one of the little girls in that church was upstairs. And she becomes a famous American. Her name is Condoleezza Rice. That she was here in this time period. So a lot of wicked things happened here, guys. They're still trying to lynch folks. They're burning down churches. There's a death. There's a death by bounty on the head of Martin Luther King Jr. It's really a mess here in this time period. Okay. In 1964, President Lyndon Johnson starts looking at ways to improve the lives of Black Americans. He had just he had just taken over from Mr. Kennedy. He's running for the presidency here in 1964. He's running against Barry Goldwater. Barry Goldwater does not want to see America do anything as for, for civil rights or for helping the black folks. He's a white supremacist during this time period that an actor from Hollywood who had been a dedicated Democrat is going to change parties. He joins up with Mr. With Mr. Goldwater, and he starts promoting Goldwater through speeches and through appearances and through film clips and all this stuff. His name is Ronald Reagan. A lot of Southerners start changing parties because they said that Lyndon Johnson, a Southerner, is going to ruin the Southern way of life. You see, guys, it takes an insider to make change happen. Lyndon Johnson is the only chance we have for civil rights in the 1960s. If, 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 if Mr. Nixon had been elected, we'd never have this happen. We're still probably living in Jim Crow, guys. Jimmy Carter might have done a little bit. He'd been so tied up, he probably couldn't have done much. Reagan wouldn't have done a darn thing. I don't think George W. Bush would have done much. Bill Clinton might have done a little bit. Barack Obama would have never been elected to the presidency, so he would never have done anything. And we could still be living in Jim Crow, guys. Because the white man may want to make sure that they kept all of the power any way they could. Any way they could. Lyndon Johnson is going to be very concerned here about what takes place in the South. In 1964, college kids from across the nation decided to invade Mississippi and register black voters. Mississippi is like 60% African American and less than 20% could vote. These were your upper middle class black folks who own businesses and own small industries that could vote. The ones who are sharecroppers, the ones who worked in the fields, they did not have a chance to vote here. And these folks here wants to make sure Mississippi has voters registered to vote in 1964's election. Okay, on June the 21st, there are three young men who are based in Marie, Mississippi, that are trying to get voters on the east side of the state. And on July the 21st, they go to a little town called Philadelphia. You leave Meridian, you go up Highway 19, and you go to a place that is called Collinsville. And from Collinsville, you're going to cross the county line into Newton County. That's a county I was born in. I was born in Union, Mississippi in 1951. My grandparents lived up here. You leave, you go into Newton County, and then you go into Neshoba County. You come to a place that's called House, H-O-U-S-C. That's where my dad was principal of House when I was born up here. My sister Judy, my brother Stan were all born up here at House. By the way, the school's mascot was a house cat. Whenever the ball team came out to play baseball or basketball or whatever, all the kids in the stands would go, meow, meow, meow. That's pretty sorry. I like I like what the what 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 uh, Nashville High School's got going on, you know, in Choctaw. I don't I think I think I don't think the house cats is a really good prevalent group. I always looked down upon the house cats since I went to until I went to school at Ole Miss, and we had a gentleman out of Texas that was going to school in his in majoring in Southern culture, and he told us his his high school ma mascot was the Fighting Ducks. So I said, well, maybe the house cats ain't too bad compared to the Fighting Ducks. Okay, well, guys. The, from there, you go right up to Bethsaida, where my grandparents live, and you go right to Tucker, where there's an Indian village there, a Choctaw Indian school at Tucker. It's ran by the Catholic Church. And then you go right into Philadelphia. It's 34 miles from Meridian to Philadelphia. 
And these three boys got into the car and they took off going to Philadelphia to register black voters. These young boys were James Cheney. James Cheney is African-American. You have Andrew Goodman and you have Mike Swerner. Mike Swerner is Jewish. So you got a white boy, a black boy, and a Jewish boy, all heading up to Neshoba County to Philadelphia, pressure for voters. Well, they went out toward the east side of town and kind of worked their way back. And here in Philadelphia, in Neshoba County, there they are picked up by the Neshoba County Sheriff's Department. This is around lunchtime. And they haul these boys off to the courthouse, where the jailhouse is located, and they are questioned until sundown. After sundown, they're released to go to their cars and head back to Meridian. But eight miles below Philadelphia, about where Bethsaida is located, is where their car was forced off the road by a bunch of hooligans. They included Klan members. They took these boys down a gravel road to where a farmer was building a lake he had a creek that ran through his property. He had dammed up the creek. He put some pipes under the, under the, up under the dam so it'd have drainage out of the lake back into the creek when the, when, the, when the lake got too high. And on this lake, they beat these boys and then shot them, executed them, and then buried them in the earthen mound, in the earthen levee. The FBI is called and they cannot find these boys. We hear on the news of these three boys missing in Neshoba County, Mississippi, not too far from my grandparents live. My grandparents were in their 60s and dad decided maybe we need to go up there and get them. My uncle Louie lived in Crestview. Louie's daughter Janine was up here when all this took place. I talked to Janine the other day on the telephone about all this stuff. Her perspective on all this stuff. Louis had agreed that living in Crestview to take grandma and grandpa back home. Was like, we'd go get them, bring them down here. And when things got cooled off in Neshoba County, we'd take them back with Uncle Louis. Let him take them back up there, make sure they was okay. So both brothers want to take care of their parents, is what it boiled down to. So on a Friday afternoon in June, we take off heading to Neshoba County, Mississippi. We live here in Valparaiso. We have a, we have a Chrysler Windsor that looks just like the Batmobile, the coolest car for a 14-year-old or for a 13-year-old to ride around in. It has a big old huge fins and is painted a mint green color. It looked like a piece of candy. And we took off heading to Mississippi in that car. Went to Crestview, went to Baker, went to Bruton, on up to Grove Hill, run Roval, Grove Hill, on into Bruton, Al Bruton Alabama, or into Butler, Alabama, Made our way on Highway 19, Mississippi. Got to Meridian. When we got off the Beltline at Meridian, got on Highway 19 at the Maddie Hersey Hospital, Dad told us, I want you kids to quit fooling around. I want you kids to sit back in your seats. We did have seat belts in this car. Put on your seat belts and sit very still as we head to Mama's house. He says, there's a lot of mean people between Meridian and Bethsaida. You see, dad played high school basketball and baseball up here. He knew all these people. He played against them in sports. We came to the little town of, of um, Collinsville and dad said, y'all sit back. Don't y'all do any swimming around. We got, we got plates on the car from Florida and I want any trouble in here. We kind of creeped our way through Collinsville, dead stay below the 35 mile an hour speed limit. Headed on up Highway 19 to the Newton County line. The first sign we saw of trouble was a sign on the side of the road, a big old huge plyboard sign nailed to a pine tree, a Southern billboard, if you will. Headed on there, head on there. If you are a in lover and it's spelled it out the old racist name was spelled out you better go home right now you better turn and go home right now the next mile we came to across the road in white letters was kkk 
every mile all the way to grandma's house had the KKK in the middle of the road at the mile markers. We took off, we, we pulled off the country store. There were Best Sadie's located. Best Sadie's is a Baptist church. Y'all can go and find it on Google Earth. You want to go look for it. It's there. My grandma's house is an old, it's a brick house in the curve of the road up there, just above the church at Best Sadie. She's on the left hand side of the road. You can see where she lived. Okay. And dad told us, he says, I want you kids to stay on grandma and grandpa's property. Grandpa had, four, had 240 acres up here. And dad said, if you leave the property, I'm going to whip you. When dad said whip you, that meant the belt. Be corporal punishment. It won't be a swat on the hand or a switch. It's going to be the belt. Well, guys, we got there, and my grandma was torn apart. She was all upset. She had gone and washed the sheets on the bed and changed out the beds for us coming. And she found a pistol. Grandpa had bought a pistol. He had bought about four boxes of bullets for his pistol, and he poured the bullets into a paper bag. He thought he could reach out and load his gun up easier to grab them out with a handful out of the bag than trying to get them out of the box. And the gun was fully loaded. Grandma said, I'd rather have seen a rattlesnake in that bedroom than to find a pistol. Grandpa didn't tell her she, he had one. Well, the most interesting thing about the pistol is that Grandpa only had one eye. Grandpa was, had lost an eye as an eight-year-old. Him and his brother Rufus was in the corn crib. We were having a corn crib fight, and Rufus hit Grandpa right dead in the eye and put his eye out. And that little boy didn't even go to the doctor. There's no such thing as going to the doctor in, 19, in 1902 and 1903. Grandpa had to suffer through it. And here he bought a gun. You don't give a one-eyed man a gun. He can't aim that gun. He can shoot anybody. It's crazy. You know, the most interesting thing about that eye, losing his eye, he did buy a glass eye. Dad said he kept it in his front pocket. When anybody came up, he'd take his eye out of his pocket and lick it and put it inside of his, inside of his socket. <laughs> well, that's pretty damn gross doing that. But, he, but the eye bothered him. So he only, he only kept it around when he had, when he had polite company come along. So he put his eye in and take it back out again. Okay. Well, dad told me, well, I actually, at grandpa's funeral in 1972, his brother Rufus had come up from, from Frostproof, Florida. And Rufus broke down crying. And the old man started to tell us how grandpa lost his eye. They always told the folks that grandpa was bouncing on the bed in the bedroom, fell off, and hit the corner of a table, and put his eye out. That's the story those two boys made up and told all these years, from 1902 to 1971. They told the same story. And, and Uncle Rufus broke down. He says, we are both big liars, and I want the truth to come out that your grandpa and I were in the core crib after grandpa told us not to be out there doing this. And I put out his eye and he says, I've never gotten over it, that I actually ruined my brother. And he had to live with that all of his life. Interesting stuff. I thought, dead gum, I got a novel out of this stuff. This is interesting stuff here about these two little boys trying to cover up what they had done when they were 10 and eight years old. Okay, so Grandpa bought a pistol. Well, Saturday morning, Grandpa and Dad got up early and decided to go to Philadelphia to find out what's going on up there. He told me and Stan that we could not go with them. Usually, we went with them to town. And I like going to Philadelphia because they had all kinds of neat stores. You could all give all, all kinds of neat toys and, and neat gadgets and all this stuff. And I like going to Philadelphia. We couldn't go. They got home about 11.30 from going to town. They were not up there very long. And my dad was spooked. I have never seen my dad physically afraid of something. And this man had gone through D-Day in World War II. And dad said, something horrible has happened up here. There might be a war breaking out up here. And says, mama, you go in there and you pack a suitcase for you and daddy. You're coming home with us. 
and Grandpa refused. Grandpa refused. And he told Marty, my grandma, you can't go either. She started crying. She wanted out of the place. She was scared to death. You see, guys, they had party lines for telephones during this time period, and you'd have 10 houses on one party line. And when the phone rang, every little old lady on the party line picked up the telephone. That's your World Wide Web in the country here in the show behind Mississippi in the, in the early 1960s was your party line on your telephone. And Grandma heard all the talk on the telephone. And she knew there was something bad going on. Papa, Grandpa wouldn't have anything to do with the party line. He let Mama handle the telephone. That was her device, not his. Grandpa always wrote letters. So we packed the car back up. And at 12 o'clock noon, we pulled out of the driveway. And I looked behind us, and Grandma was falling behind the car. And she stopped about halfway down that little dirt road. She stopped, and she walked back to the house. I'll never forget that. Then I talked to Janine. Janine was there when all this took place. She's over at Grandma, Grandma Pierce's. Grandma Pierce was about a mile up the road from Grandma Weatherford. Janine said, I remember Grandma getting a telephone call. And Grandma says, you're kidding me. Well, I knew, he was, I knew that he was mean enough to kill somebody. But I just can't believe all this took place up here. And those three boys are, are dead out there in that levee. And nobody seems to be able to find them. And nobody's going to open their mouths up because the Ku Klux Klan will burn them out and will kill the whole household. And that scared Janine. She was talking about a man whose name was Edgar Ray Killen. And, uh, and, uh, uh, Mr. Killen, Edgar Ray Killen, was a Baptist minister. He preached at Pine Grove Baptist Church on the road to Union, Mississippi, just outside of house. Y'all can go and Google and find Pine Grove Church out there on, high, out there on the highway between Union, out there between house and, and Union. Edgar Ray Killen preached my great-grandpa's funeral in 1954. Grandpa died in July of 1954. He was born in 1890. He was born in, he was born in 1862. When he, when he was born, his papa was at, is at Shiloh in the Civil War. And Grandpa Will had died. We had just moved to Liberty, Mississippi. It was only down there about a week. We had to go back to the funeral. And I remember this funeral because Dad and Uncle Murray, his other brother, were crying in the funeral or during the funeral. And Edgar Ray Killing preached the funeral. I was there as a four-year-old to hear Edgar Ray Killing preach the funeral of my great-grandpa. Dad grew up with Edgar Ray Killing. He knew him really well. Played ball with him in high school. Knew him as a preacher when we lived at house. He was always seemed to be around. He'd always be at Cliff, Cliff Winston's country store from time to time. We'd run into him up there. Nobody could figure out who killed these boys. Oh, they tried the sheriff's department. They went through and had trials. They all were, they all were hung juries and all this stuff. They did find a few people on federal charges of the Dividing Civil Rights Act. But they never could find the killer of this man, of these three boys. In 2004, sitting right here in my kitchen, this used to be, it wasn't all a kitchen, it used to be a, a little sitting area. I turned into a big, huge kitchen. But Dad's chair was sitting right over there. TV says on this wall over here. And CNN broadcasted a news bulletin. They had found the murder of the three Neshoba County boys who died in 1964 and named Edgar Ray Killing as a murderer of these boys. My dad broke down crying. I said, Dad, did you know him? I grew up with him. I would have never imagined that he would have done this. I want to ask you guys a question. If you go to a church that's got an older minister, 
and he went through and married your grandma and grandpa, baptized your mom and daddy and all the aunts and uncles, then married your parents, then baptized you, how would you feel about your religion? I want to tell you something. I want to go through the car wash again. I want to go through back to those baptismal waters again and try to get some of that slum off of me, that slime off of me from these kind of people. You never know who you're dealing with. And Edgar Ray Killing is one of them. Okay? I got tickled at Janine. She told me that she says when her mom and daddy passed away, this is back around, this was her mom had died about three years ago. Her dad, dad died about 10 years ago. She said when they went to go to bury Uncle Louie, they went to Pine Grove Cemetery. They walked, that's where my grandparents are buried at Pine Grove. And they say they walked into the gate there at Pine Grove going into, going into the graveyard. And said on the left hand side was a big, huge tombstone they had on there, Edgar Ray Killing. He's not dead yet. He's still alive, but his tombstone is already there. And when Janine and Valerie and Carrie saw that tombstone, they turned and walked out of the Pine Grove Cemetery. They said, Ain't no way in hell we're going to bury mom and daddy. And here was a mass murderer. So they went down to the Baptist Church, into the Bassadia Baptist Church, and that's where they married, that's where they buried Aunt Nadine and Uncle Louie. They had Bassadia. And I wonder how many people has, has, has avoided the Pine Grove Cemetery because of Eric Ray's killings. Tomb still sitting up there. I, as far as I know, he's still alive. Uh, he's still at Pritchman, Parchment Prison for doing He's probably about 90, 90 years old, 91 years old today, maybe his late 80s. He's on up there. Okay. But guys, I saw this. I saw this happening here as a kid. It's amazing how you remember all this stuff. Oh, Mrs. started an encyclopedia. Well, actually we started a, a new magazine that's online. It's an online magazine by Miss, by Miss Mississippi, Mississippi History. And I'm thinking seriously of writing all this up and sending it to, to, Jay, to TJ and all these guys up here at Ole Miss and let them go through and put on this new magazine they're putting out. I have written articles for the Encyclopedia Mississippi. I do have several articles in, in the new Encyclopedia Mississippi. But uh, it'd be interesting to write an article from my perspective from a boy from Florida who goes up here in the midst of this murder that took place in this time period. Interesting stuff to look at. I want to tell you guys, you're going to live some history in your time period. Y'all just get ready for it. You're going to experience some history. And you don't realize that one day you might be a professor at a little small college in Northwest Florida telling the kids about what you experienced and what you saw. Okay, right behind these murders here on June, July the 2nd, President Lyndon Johnson, who is running for the presidency, is going to sign the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 is illegal to discriminate in employment and illegal to segregate public facilities. The Plessy case is finally dead. In 1964, the remnants that are holding on to the Plessy case are finally dead. It's illegal to discriminate in employment and illegal to segregate public spaces. In 1965, February the 1st, 1965, a group of black citizens have gotten together in Selma, Alabama. One of these guys is Joey Lewis, Joe Lewis, the former senator who just passed away. They're going together in Selma, Alabama to have a march to have a march to Montgomery, Alabama. It's gonna be a freedom march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. Now, the Alabama River is on the south side of town. You got to cross the Alabama River to get on, to stay on Highway 80 to go to Montgomery. It's about an 80 mile drive from Montgomery to Selma. Okay, so it's about a three, three day, about a three day or four day walk. When these guys get to the Edmund Pettus Bridge, the bridge over the Alabama River, on the other side, on the eastern shore of the river, are the highway patrolmen and a bunch of roughneck people who determined to stop this march. Joe Lewis is in the lead of this. And here the police orders these people to halt to do not march forward. And these people are going to be run down by the police and these roughnecks here. They have billy clubs. They have bully clubs. They have pipes. They have two by fours. They have the whole nine yards. J 
Joe Lewis was hit in the head. He thought he was going to die. He had he had a concussion from this. All they want is the freedom to vote. But I want to tell you something, guys. The news media was there when this took place. If you want to see the film, the film of this, go to your blackboard, to the videos, and you'll see it. Okay, guys? They ran them down. They hurt these people. A few weeks later on Easter Sunday, here comes Dr. Martin Luther King. Joe Lewis is with them. And they're going to march all the way to Selma. This, this, is, in the, this is in the spring of 1965. Okay, they're going to march all the way to Montgomery from Selma. And when they get there, President Johnson is going to take a very close eye on what has happened here in this time period. On August the 6th, August the 6th, 1960, 1965, Lyndon Johnson is going to sign what is called the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act is going to get rid of the poll tax. It's going to get rid of the grandfather clause. It's going to get rid of, get rid of the literacy test. The Plessy case and all of his trimmings is going to go away here, guys, in August of 1965. Okay? Now, the president could have, could have done this running for the presidency. It's civil rights that he got away with. If he had passed this act while running for the presidency in 1964, probably Goldwater would have won. The South would have totally abandoned Lyndon Johnson and gone with Goldwater in this time period. On the 21st day of February, 1965, in Harlem, New York, Malcolm X is going to be assassinated. Malcolm X is one of the, was one of the major black leaders of the civil rights movement, but Malcolm X said that Dr. King was doing it too easily, that they should not have peaceful protests. It was time for a militancy. It was time to go in there with weapons and have a war. And, and Martin King says, if you give these white folks a reason to shoot us, they will. And he pointed out what happened in Oxford and what happened in, two, what happened in Tuscaloosa when George Wallace was forced to integrate the University of Alabama in 1963. They pointed all of this stuff out, guys. And Mr. Johnson is going to pass the Voting Rights Act on August the 6, 1965. How did Lyndon Johnson do it? He went to his senators, he went to his House members, and he told them they were going to do it. He threatened them. Just like Andrew Jackson threatened his House and Senate, Lyndon Johnson did too. And he told them, he said, you be on the right side of the law or the wrong side of the law. You be on the right side of history or the wrong side of history. How do you want the people to see you in the future? How do you want them to see you in the future? So the Voting Rights Act got rid of the poll tax, the literacy exams, and the grandfather clause, okay? Now, in October of 1966, another group is going to form, and they call themselves the Black Panthers. The Black Panthers is going to be founded in Oakland, California. Huey Newton and Bobby Seale are the two new leaders of this group. And, of course, they want to see more radicalism. They want to see more marching and not so much pacifism as you're seeing from Dr. King. By the way, by 1966, Dr. King has kind of departed from his missions after the Voting Rights Act. He kind of met his goals, and now he's going against the war in Vietnam. Mr. Mr. King, Dr. King, believes the Vietnam War is being used to get rid of black men, and it was. A lot of your soldiers in Vietnam were poor black boys from Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, and across the South. And he said that these boys are being put in harm's way under the disguise of communism, and America needs to get out of Vietnam. Okay? And Lyndon Johnson has built it all up during this time period. Okay? Then we have the long, hot summers. We have riots across the country. In August of 65, we had the Watts riots in Los Angeles, California. They were very militant. These riots were very bloody. After the riots took place, the, po the police chief and the mayor of LA declared that this, this problem was caused by communists, that these people in Watts were communists. No, 
These are American citizens who are tired of being denied their personal freedoms. And they want to become part of America in the greatest of traditions. And they had to do riots here, protest, to get, the, to get, the, to get their agenda on the table. Then in July of 1967, a black, cap, a, a, black, a black cab drive owner is being pulled out of his car in Newark, New Jersey and beaten by the police. This causes a big riot to take place in Newark, New Jersey. This, this riot took place on July the 13th, 1967. Then on July the 20th, 1967, just a few days later, you had a major riot in Detroit. The riot in Detroit got so bad that the United States Army are going to bring tanks to roll down the streets of Detroit. President Johnson ordered the Army into Detroit with their tanks to put down these riots. People are trying to get their personal freedoms. And then they decided, Lyndon Johnson decided to have a commission to discuss, to discuss and try to understand what is causing all this militancy, all these riots in the United States. And they formed what is called the Kerner Commission. That's spelled K-E-R-N-E-R, -E -E the Kerner Commission. We spend some forty billion, some forty million dollars, forty million dollars on this, on this study trying to figure out what's causing all these racial problems in America. And after about eight months of study and of the deliberation, <clears throat> they concluded it was caused by white supremacy. White supremacy. I could have told them that in 1967. I'd been, uh, what, uh, I'd been right at 15 years old. I could have told them right then and there what caused this problem okay june the june the 12th 1967 the supreme court is going to hear a court case it is called loving versus virginia the supreme court is going to hear a court case that is against a court case that is against interracial marriages the state of virginia outlawed interracial marriages in 1690 it's part of the old Barbados slave codes. And here in 1967, just barely 40 years ago, 50 years ago, we're going to have the Supreme Court rule on interracial marriages. And the Supreme Court is going to rule that these marriages are legal, that they are legal. I remember being at church during this time period and hearing people say, it's going to ruin the sanctity of marriage. You let these black folks and white folks and Indian folks and, and Asian folks all get to marry each other, and it's going to create a mongrel race of people that America will be destroyed because of interracial marriages. It's going to ruin the sanctity of marriage. I heard the same thing with Mr. Obama's Supreme Court working on gay rights and gay marriages. Heard the same thing. And you realize America becomes stronger and more diverse when people are allowed to marry the ones they love. But the key word here is love, not hate. It's very interesting to hear all this stuff. Okay, October the 2nd, 1967, a Supreme Court job becomes open and President, President Johnson is going to appoint a new head, our new judge of the Supreme Court. The man he's going to send to the Supreme Court is going to be Thurgood Marshall, the great black lawyer for the civil rights movement, the great lawyer for the NAACP, now goes to the Supreme Court. He'll be there until the early 1980s. He'll retire. He will not, he will not die enough. He will retire. He becomes a Supreme Court judge. His judge. In 1968 is a very troublesome year for America. I'm going to go into that more in the next lecture. On April the 4th, Dr. King is going to be in Memphis, Tennessee. He's been there for several days. He flew in toward the 1st of April. The big problem in Memphis was a garbage strike. A lot of your garbage workers were on strike wanting better wages during this time period. Dr. King comes over to try to help litigate this strike. Okay? The workers only wanted a three cent raise. That's all they want, wanted. But these garbage workers were all mostly African-American. 
and the mayor was determined that these black folks would not get a raise. It's all white supremacist. Well, on that Friday night, or on that Thursday night, I should say, the 3rd of April, Dr. King is going to go to an old Masonic hall. These old Masonic halls were built in the 1800s. There are several around South Alabama. If you guys want to see an old Masonic hall, you'll go to St. Stephen's. They have one up there. Purdue Hill has one on Highway 84. At the guy Monroe will head toward the Alabama River. There's no Masonic Lodge up there. These are big old huge wooden buildings. They're two story. The upstairs is where the lodge was. The downstairs was a public school. They had the school going on in the lodge on the bottom floor. The up, upper part of the floor was used for the lodge meetings. Okay, most of these were Masonic lodges, is what they were. Okay. This old building had wooden shutters on the outside of the building that were not latched. And during his speech, a storm comes up, one of those big, huge thunderstorms that come across the Mississippi River and hit Memphis. And we've been through them down here, these big, huge thunderstorms that cause lots of wind and push over trees and all this stuff. Well, during his speech, those shutters began to hit the side of the buildings and it sounded like gunfire. And Dr. King got very jumpy in this. He got very upset over what's going on here during his speech. But during his speech, he talked about Moses. You talk about Moses and the children of Israel when Moses has reached the promised land. God had told the children of Israel that they were the new children because the old children they brought out of Egypt had sinned against God. They brought in idols and idol worship and all this stuff. And God punished them by making them spend 40 years in the wilderness. They wanted for 40 years in the wilderness. And finally, they come to the promised land. And here's a great mountain, and God allows Moses to climb the mountain. Okay, Moses is going to climb this mountain to see the promised land. And then Moses will die because he can't go over either because he's part of that group who had sinned. And Dr. King says to his people here in this meeting, I have gone to the top of the mountain, and I have looked over into the promised land. And the promised land looks bright for our people. If we keep a struggling and we keep working together, we will one day have a black, a black president. One day we'll have equality across America. And your children will live in a world of very little violence. That your kids will be educated. That your kids will reach the American dream. They'll go from slavery of 1619 and to a dreamland of the 21st century. I have looked over and I have seen the promised land. The next afternoon, the Lorraine Hotel, Lee Harvey Oswald, I'm sorry, Ray, uh, what's his first name? Um, I'll come to me. I have to think about his first name is here. Uh, maybe I've it written down over here. James Earl Ray. James Earl Ray. And a hotel across from the Rain Hotel in downtown Memphis is going to see an entourage of black men who are out here on the balcony. And these includes Jesse Jackson. It includes uh, uh, several of your prominent black leaders of today. And when Dr. King walks out onto the balcony, going to, going to supper, shots ring out and, John, and, uh, and James Earl Ray has shot and killed Dr. King. The 4th of April of 1968 is Good Friday. It is Good Friday. Sunday is Easter. Dr. King is killed on the same day that Jesus Christ was killed when he hung on the cross. They had a major, major look for the person who killed Dr. King. And they finally found him in England. Now, here's the story about Mr. Ray. James Earl Ray was a little petty theft, a little petty thief. He'd been released a few weeks earlier from a prison camp over in Missouri. According to the story, he went to, uh, to the shoals of Alabama, to Tuskegee, I mean, to, uh, to Tuscumbia, Alabama. Shellfield, Tuscumbia, Muscle, Muscle Shoals, the, the Tri-Cities of Northwest Alabama. And up here, he bought, a, he bought a gun that was used to shoot Dr. King with. Then he just disappeared. They said he left and went to Detroit, Michigan, crossed over into Canada, went to, went to um, 
um, Montreal, boarded a plane and flew to England. Now, how could a man just out of prison buy a high-powered rifle, go to Memphis, Tennessee, disappear, and end up in England? Somebody was behind it. And so who killed Dr. King becomes the same kind of mystery as who killed John Kennedy. And Coretta Scott King and the King children believe that James Earl Ray did not do the deed. Some folks believe the FBI did it. They did say that when the word got to the Memphis FBI headquarters in Memphis, that they broke out the champagne and celebrated the death of Dr. King. I don't know how true that, true that really is, but that's what I've heard, okay? Then in 19, and in April the 11th, just a few days after Dr. King's death, Lyndon Johnson is gonna sign in a new Civil Rights Act. That means it's illegal to, to discriminate in sales of rental property, the financing of homes, and to make sure American cities and their neighborhoods are integrated. It's illegal to discriminate in the rental and sales of rental property and the financing of homes. This is where the Trump family, you started using Roy Kahn here, trying to make sure they can get around this law, not to be able to lease and rent to black folks. Rachel, uh, Dr. Uh, President Trump's father was extremely racist and didn't want to see black folks in his buildings or in his neighborhoods that he's developed during this time period. And that's when he brings in Roy Kahn, the district attorney here in New York City, to help him out, keep him out of trouble here in this time period. Then in 1970, under Mr. Richard Nixon, they're going to pass in Congress the Equal Rights and Job Opportunities Minority Hiring Act. Good Lord, what a title that is. All right, just call it the Equal Rights and Job Opportunities Minority Hiring Act, okay? It says that every American business must be 10% minority. If you have 10 employees in your, in your employment, one of those people must be a woman, African American, Asian American, Latino American, or whatever that 10% of your employees must be a minority background. Oh my goodness, this gave the airline companies a headache. The United States Air Force did not have black pilots during this time period. There are no young men qualified to fly these airliners in this time period. What a mess. Well, when I worked on my little thing about Southern Airways, my little manuscript, and I talked to, to Captain Ed out of Portland Beach, I asked him, I said, what'd y'all do about the NARA hiring act? He says, well, it's very, very simple. He says, my airline, Southern Airways, was started as a civilian pilot training school during World War II. Frank Hultz, who was still president of Southern during this time period, he'll be there until the airline merges into, into Make Republic and then Northwest. He'll be around for a while. Frank Hultz, decided to rebuild or reestablish his training schools. And he says that we took our recruiters from Southern Airways who normally go to Auburn and Alabama and Georgia and so forth, these different colleges, to look for people to work for Southern. And they didn't do it quite often. Southern usually had a pretty good amount of people to work for. But they decided to go to Alabama State, to go to Florida, Florida A&M. They went to Shaw University. They went to, they went to, um, to um, um, North Carolina A&M, they went to Fisk University, they went to Alcorn State, they went to the universities here in the South, who were traditionally black universities. And here they recruited young men to become pilots. They also recruited young ladies to become flight attendants. Now this is on the verge before women started flying and before men became flight attendants. That's gonna change by 1975, you're gonna start seeing female pilots in the cockpit, you're gonna start seeing male flight attendants. Okay, well guys, Frank Hulse reopened his, his flying school there in Atlanta. He's right there across the runway from Southern Airways headquarters over on, over on the northwest corner of the, of the airport. It was called Hangar One. It was, it, was, it, was a, it was a commercial. Well, actually, it was, an air, it was an airplane company that sold airplanes. They sold the Beechcraft Bonanzas and those, those little private airplanes over at Hangar One. So he opened that up to send these some 40 boys, these young men, to be going to flight training school. 
And once these guys had passed their basic exams and got themselves with the pilot's license, then he sent them all off down to Emory University and Daytona Beach. And here these 40 young men will get their full-fledged pilot's license. And by 1975, these African-American pilots that were hired through this Minority Hiring Act would be flying DC-9 jet liners. The last of these young men have just retired from Delta Airlines. Southern merged to form Republic with North Central Airlines. North Central was bought out, bought out by Northwest. And then around 2009, Delta bought out Northwest. And so now the boys who flew for Northwest are flying for Delta and they're retiring on Boeing 777s and Boeing 787s and so forth. They had gone from little DC-9s that carry 75 people to airplanes that are carrying over 200 people. And these young men did quite well for themselves. The young ladies who joined, joined Southern as flight attendants, they stayed on the Republic and Northwest and Delta, and they're now retiring from being flight attendants. And all these young ladies were hired by Southern Airways in 1970, 1971, under this Minority Hiring Act. So you see how this stuff kind of works here uh, in, our, in our times, okay? What I want to do now, guys, is to end this lecture. I think we've gone on enough, long enough on this one, and we pretty much covered the, the 60s on this lecture and, the, and, and what's going on here. I did spend a little bit more time on this lecture than I wanted to, but I gave you guys some pretty good stuff in this lecture. I think I gave you all an idea of what's really happened in the 1970s, the 1960s. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the next lecture, next lecture number 11 is going to start, and it's going to deal with the challenges of a terrorist world. And we're going to discuss the 1968 time period and make our way on into the 20th century. Okay. All right, guys.